I'm going to call to order uh, the Norco City Council regular meeting for Wednesday, June 19th at uh, 6.05. If the clerk will please take the roll. Councilmember Newton? Here. Councilmember Hoffman? Yes. Councilmember Bash? Yes. Councilmember, or excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem Hanna? Yes. Mayor Grunmeyer? Yes. Thank you. All are present. Thank you. At this time, the City Council will recess to closed session to consider the items on the agenda. I'm going to call the City Council meeting back to order and reconvene the public session. I apologize for the delay. Um, at this time, we will have our City Attorney report on actions taken in closed session. On item one, the council gave settlement authority, and on item two, there was no reportable action. Thank you very much. So we are going to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Bash, and then remain standing for invocation, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, it's my pleasure to call up Paul Christensen from Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Our Father in Heaven, we are grateful to uh, gather together as citizens of this community and leaders of our community and express our gratitude for all of thy blessings upon our community. We are grateful for the men and women who serve us as employees and are grateful for their efforts. We're grateful for the many men and women who volunteer their services to our community and contribute of their time and talent and resources and express our appreciation for their efforts. We uh, pray thy blessings to be upon our community and all of the efforts that are taking place within our community, that our businesses may prosper, that our citizens may have goodwill towards one another, and especially that our youth may find themselves located in a place which will foster good feelings of respect and kindness for one another. We love thee and are appreciative of this great country in which we live and for those men and women who have sacrificed for us. We offer this prayer to thee with gratitude for thee and for thy son and do so in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to call up Scott DeRosa for our business appreciation honoree. And I'd like to go ahead and call up uh, Joe Centino. Is Joe here? No, neither. Hmm. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Scott Rosa, and I'm a member of the Narco Economic Development Advisory Council, known as EDAC. And on behalf of the City Council and EDAC, I am pleased to assist Mayor Grunmeyer with presenting this month's Business Appreciation Award to Ace Hardware. I don't believe that there's anything more traditional than a family-owned neighborhood hardware store in a small rural town. I believe most everyone in Norco is familiar with, the, with our local Ace Hardware store and the personalized service they provide. Norconians Michael and Nicolina Brand opened their Ace Hardware franchise in 1977 and it's become a staple in our small town. Now owned by their daughter Nancy Shepard and managed by Joe Centino, who's been working there since its beginning, our local Ace Hardware continues to be that small mom and pop shop to go to when you need hardware for your home or your ranch. They also support many charities and community events as well as employing our local residents. So congratulations to Ace Hardware for being the recipient of Norco's June 2019 Business Appreciation Award. And now I'll turn the mic over to Mayor Grimmeyer. Thank you. 
So we have a plaque for them that reads, the city of Norco hereby honors Ace Hardware for its local ownership's commitment to personalized service consistent with the hometown values of Horsetown USA. So we will make sure that they get this. So we're going to go ahead and proceed to our regular business agenda with item number one, which is City Council Communications Reports on Regional Boards and Commissions. So we will start with um, Mayor Pro Tem Hanna. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, if you notice, sir, July the 1st, the uh, RTA uh, rates are going to go up. I think they're going to go up about 10 to 15 cents. They haven't raised them in 10 years, so that's all I've got to report on uh, on that one. Uh, there we have one from Vector. That's a new virus that's infecting people in China, and they believe that little tick there is the culprit, and you're asking why I bring something in from China. Well, if you shop at Walmart, your clothes come from China, so that little booger could come in on a shipment of uh, clothes and be over here in the United States before you know it, just like the uh, uh, malaria mosquito that's fishing ahead us big time that they're really fighting hard on now in this country. And on uh, another note with RCTC, if you read the paper today, you notice that we now have uh, total funding for three future products or projects coming into the area. One of them is uh, an extra lane on the 91 freeway going from uh, Green River to the 241 toll lane uh, side there. Uh, they figure that lane will help move traffic right on when they get off of Green River onto the 91, they can stay in that lane and get right onto the 241 up there. And uh, one thing we did at our little subcommittee meeting last week with Orange County is the Transportation Commission was wanting to build a flyover from the 241 toll lanes into the eastbound uh, 91 toll lanes, which is fine. It'll stop that uh, jam up down there on the 241 in the afternoon, but we we voted against it and Orange County sided with us on it. And they went back later at their regular board meeting and voted against it again because we want them to wait till uh, 2022 when all the construction's done up here on this end on the on the 15th, so we figured if they had construction going on both ends, nobody would move at all. So uh, at least by them delaying it for a while, it'll kind of keep traffic moving it a little bit. And that's all I have. Thank you. Councilman Hoffman. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to ask Councilman Hanna real quick, next time you're at Vector Control, could you ask them about uh, the typhus and the fleas and rodents if they're checking into it when you get a chance? Yeah, uh, somebody mentioned a little bit about something about that today, but I'll find out tomorrow because they'll be at that deal we're going okay. to. Okay, I knew you had a meeting, Marcia. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's, bad. it's bad in L.A. County, Correct. and you know it's going to move out here. Correct. Uh, <clears throat> Well, this is what you're looking at on the screen was the Western Community Energy Meeting, and uh, I know it's hard to read up there, but I'll go down to the bottom. Uh, the WCE through uh, WRCOG did a uh, survey for, uh, for the voter and ratepayer survey, and I'll kind of look through there. They had a total of uh, 318 voters that they were surveyed in English, Spanish, and Chinese regarding what WCE is, and the WCE is our uh, our energy program that we're trying to get started here in uh, Western Riverside County. 
our start date has been pushed back uh, to April of uh, 2020, uh, basically because of Southern California Edison uh, recomputering uh, and redoing their system, their IT people, and it might be as far as June of 2020, depending on when uh, Southern California Edison gets that project accomplished. Uh, that comes back to where leadership doesn't talk to IT people and the IT people won. But overall in the survey, and uh, hopefully if one of you got a phone call from them, or you, they surveyed Narconians, and I'll read over here the uh, survey so you don't have to read that small print. Uh, 58, overall 58.5% said they support participating in the Western Community Energy. You can save, we're going to project saving you 2% on your electric bill right now. Uh, overall 68.6% .6 agree they're in favor of saving any amount on their Edison bill. Over 64.8% agree to support alternative energy options to Southern California Anderson. And then overall, 61% prefer energy rates set by local elected officials at public meetings rather than uh, having somebody up in uh, the Bay Area decide where on the uh, CPUC decide what your rates are for, uh, for you. <clears throat> Interesting to note, <laughs> Narcodians, you never surprise me. You're, you're all Missourians. Uh, it's a show me type of state. Uh, Norco was very skeptical when the, of, uh, of the whole WCE program and the survey, which is good. Uh, I mean, you, you challenge uh, what everybody else, the, uh, the young millennials uh, from Eastvale and what they wanted, uh, the folks in Arupa Valley, uh, the Hammett, even the older people in, in Hammett, but you guys were very skeptical in the situation and wanted to know more and wanted to uh, say, okay, show me the savings, the reality of it. So that's good. I'm glad you guys are questioning that. So uh, we'll continue to bring you updates on this thing, but like I said, uh, our pushback uh, was, uh, for start, is going to be at least until mid-year 2020. And the other one, Matt, if you can, uh, keep going. Flag Day. I want to thank everyone that came out on July 14th and helped us commemorate Flag Day up at the memorial. I uh, especially want to thank the Inland Christian Choir uh, for the, all the music that they sung, and along with the uh, Park and Rec staff and the Veterans Committee for helping us put that thing together. Uh, the people that came out, uh, it was a beautiful ceremony. If you get to see, uh, I believe the Facebook page is Life in Norco, uh, check Gary Evans' uh, videos on what the, he did posted three of them. Very excellent uh, job he did up there. So Brian, you and your staff did an excellent job and I appreciate it. Thank you. And that's all, Madam Mayor. Councilman Bash. Uh, so I went to a bunch of stuff. And um, most importantly, a couple of things. Uh, June 14th, I went up to Sacramento and attended the League of Cities Community Services Committee meeting. Uh, it's a... Uh, it was very interesting that I kind of felt it was a little bit schizophrenic because the staff is very excited about the budget of the governor. Very excited. And it's going to help homelessness and housing and uh, all very, very important issues, uh, PERS, pensions. Uh, but the people that were there were upset. And they were upset that... Uh, at a lot of a lot of the budget items, uh, it's it's projected that uh, our surplus will be gone and will actually be broke in three years. Um, there's a lot of uh, if you're from Southern California, there's a real north south kind of uh, battle going on. Um, there's a just there's just a lot. People are not happy with the super duper majority. And so you kind of, when you're sitting around having coffee between your sessions, uh, you're hearing these things. Um, one of the things that's being formed, and we were kind of out of the loop, Ted and I sit on that committee, is we're forming the Rural Communication Exchange, which is going to be called Rural X, and it's rural communities. Uh, we're one of the founding members, but uh, the League of Cities doesn't want to give us status as an organization. They'll allow us to have meetings, they'll allow us to utilize a certain amount of staff time, but it's basically to kind of call out the governor and say, hey, you said you were going to support rural cities. We have a unique set of problems. Um, 
And I was relayed to me today that they're very nervous about giving that kind of power to a group because they don't want us to align with like the rural counties of California. Um, the Coastal Commission, actually, there was a, a coastal group like ours that has aligned with the Coastal Commission, which makes them more powerful than the League of Cities. That's why a lot of the laws that were passed, you saw reps carving out, well, it's not going to apply to my area. It's not going to apply here. It's not going to apply that. They were carve-outs. So there was quite a bit of that going on. Um, but all in all, it was a really illuminating meeting, and I believe I sent you, um, I'm not sure if I did actually, uh, I will send you the paperwork on some of the different things that are coming up. Uh, there is one uh, SB50, we knocked it down, there was a lot of relief about that. SB50 was the one that would kind of take over your neighborhood, but there's another one. And uh, they're trying to push that through. I mean, just imagine, they can buy a house next door to you, put in 300 apartments, and they're not required to have parking. Where are they going to park in Norco? One side of the street's a horse trail. So we're in the process of fighting that, um, and it's uh, interesting. And then just on another note, um, the high transmission lines, we somehow, through a staff error, uh, we didn't become party status in that. And I'm telling you right now, every council person has been involved in that for years. Uh, and so we sort of thought we fixed it. And basically, um, we have kind of a stake in the game because, as you recall, um, a quarter of Norco was actually evacuated when there was a fire down in the river. So we would like the commissioners to hear that. We would like the judge to hear that, to say, hey, these uh, high transmission lines just burned down half of Northern California, and we'd kind of like to not have that happen in Norco again. It wasn't transmission lines, but we are next to the river. And so the city of Riverside and Edison are trying to block that effort so that we can't be a party and may not be able to um, uh, present our case up in Sacramento when they make that final hearing. Uh, the big issue is is that the environmental impact study doesn't have any of the fire concerns. Sadly, we got support from the local fire department to help us, but by the time it worked its way up to the lawyers, they basically wouldn't release the letter that basically said, yeah, there's kind of a fire danger down there. Although they have noted that that is a fire, high, high propensity fire area. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. And then um, I did attend today, just one last thing, I attended the Norco Chamber our Commerce Legislative Update meeting and uh, representatives from Sabrina Cervantes, yes, they are back in our, they're back. Um, and uh, uh, Senator Roth and uh, Karen Spiegel, our supervisor. And it was actually a very, very, I only beat up on them a little, um, but it was actually a very, very good session and I kind of got to talk about how things are going in Norco and uh, I think that's, and then one other thing I'm kind of sad on a personal note, they let uh, Brian Reese go over at Norco College. I think it was a gigantic mistake. And what makes me angriest is we have a district, and our district representative is Bill Hedrick. Bill Hedrick is the college district for everybody who lives in Norco, Eastvale, Corona, and part of Europa Valley. They fired our college president. A huge support for this guy. Won't get into why or how, all that stuff. But our trustee, our one voice, was not there when they did that. And I hope he has, and I like Bill, and I respect respect him a lot, but why he wasn't there, I just don't understand it. And you know what? Feel free to call the guy out. That's all I have, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Newton. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening. Uh, so uh, June 6th, we had our uh, monthly Chino Basin Desalter Authority, and I thought I'd just r run down a little bit on the numbers. We. Uh, have been working on and we adopted our uh, capital and uh, operations maintenance budget uh, for 19 uh, and 2020. Um, revenues 44 million 239 against expenses of 45 million 334. So we will be decreasing our reserve balance by a little over a million dollars. And the bottom line on that is going to work out. It's kind of a wide range, but uh, the cost of water is estimated to be between seven hundred and twenty-three thousand and nine hundred and seventy-six dollars uh, this next year per acre foot. Um, 
I can't explain why we have such a wide range of cost. We're, we're obligated to buy a thousand square feet, so we, out of the uh, approximately 35,000 uh, acre feet that's produced by the authority. Uh, we also uh, had a discussion, uh, which I'm going to be talking about later tonight under other matters, is uh, regarding consultants and suppliers, and it's a project management term called scope of work creep. And it's uh, what happens when your consultants and your vendors, uh, their uh, costs start creeping out of control, little by little, and it's a very interesting, unique study. Um, that's all I have right now. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, and I don't have anything to report, so we will move on to item number two, which is uh, our- Madam Mayor, may yes. I just say something very quickly? Yes. Um, she was also, I just want people to know, she was also at that meeting for the president of Norco College, and she spoke so eloquently and so professionally, and I just really want to give kudos to the mayor for, for the comments that she made, really. Thank you. We'll move on to city council consent items. Uh, all items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine in uh, nature and can be enacted in one motion. Prior to the motion to consider any action by the council, any public comments on any of the consent items will be heard. There will be no separate action unless members of the council or the audience request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar. Items removed from consent calendar will be separately considered under item number three three on our agenda. So with that, uh, I will ask the council if there are any to pull. 2C for Bash. And Newton. And Newton. And Hoffman. It's a three for. Any other items to be pulled? Yes, Madam Mayor, I'd like to pull item number 2G. Okay. Any others? Okay, so we'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve the rest. There's second. 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 And Mayor, may I make a comment? Sure. Uh, will the clerk show that I abstain from item H? Okay. And for the clerk's reference, I will abstain from uh, 2D. Is that acceptable? Okay. All right. With those two abstentions noted, uh, I think we're ready to vote. Please vote. Vote is unanimous. Okay, thank you. So we will move on to item three, and we will start with item C. So I'll go in alphabetical order. Councilman Bash, you're up first. Uh, I just had a question. Um, on 4A, Steve, I noticed it was a 3-2 vote, a request for approval of an accessory building use permit to allow a 900 square foot large vehicle parking building at 2275 Gulfstream Lane and that um, apparently somebody thought it should be torn down before it was rebuilt. Is it totally within code at this time? It is not. The building has to be torn down and moved to the approved location. Okay. And rebuilt. What were the, the no's? What were the... Uh, just the, the sequence of events. Uh, they felt that the building should have been gone first before they came forward to reapply. Uh, that's all I have, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Hoffman? Yeah, that was my question, too, on that. Did this building come to us as a council on an appeal a year and a half ago? Yes. And at that time, the council's decision was the building had to be moved because it was built it, oh, without a permit. It had to be removed. Removed. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, and then my other question on the 
uh, B on uh, 3B on that one. Um, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong because we only have the short minutes here, is there is no, the monument area for that uh, was removed then at, for the entranceway on that or? No, that was added. <laughs> that was added. Yes. A monument for that. Okay, I'll let uh, Councilman Newton have his say on that one. Councilman Newton. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, Steve, I'm gonna close the deal here. Okay. All right. So, item 3B, variance. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm gonna make a motion that this should come to council, I guess as an appeal uh, of the <coughs> Planning Commission's decision. Um, I, I agree with the addition, uh, additional condition of adding a monument. This is a gateway entrance to the city. So not a problem with that. I have a problem with the variance being granted for a reduction in landscape requirements. And, and am I reading the, that correctly? That that variance was granted to allow the applicant to re reduce the landscaping? Yeah, the, what the Planning Commission did is they, they approved a reduction of a landscape planner from a required 10 feet to five feet, but the overall percentage of landscaping, the project does meet that requirement. So there's a landscape planner next to Second Street that was is required to be 10 feet. They they couldn't accommodate the 10 feet and still maintain the circulation around the around the site with the 25 foot that's needed for two-way traffic. And so what they did is they requested a variance to reduce that landscape planner from 10 feet to five feet, but they still do meet the 15% requirement that the, that the uh, CG zone requires. Why would a variance be required then at all if they met the overall require, uh, percentage of landscaping? Because that landscape strip was supposed to be 10 feet and they could only fit five feet. And in exchange, the the three planning commission members that voted to approve it felt that the addition of some monumental art or fountain at the corner would suffice for that uh, approved variance. Okay, I don't have an issue with the, the monument sign. Like I said, uh, I'd like to see this come back. I'd, I'd like a, a, a report to council on the landscaping. I'm, I'm just not comfortable with the variance and, and, the, and the explanation that you're giving, okay? So just the variance, not the CUP? Yeah, I'd bring the whole thing, Steve. If you're making a motion, I'll second that. Okay, yeah, well, it's been... Or, or, I'm, I still gotta go to four. You wanna do them separately? Yeah. I, yeah, I think so. Oh, That'll sure. be easiest okay. for the clerk, probably. So it's been moved and seconded to appeal item 3B of the June 12th Planning Commission meeting. Please vote. Oh, okay. <coughs> Motion passes unanimous. All right, thank you. Thank you. Councilman Newton. So Steve, on item 4A, the site plan on this accessory building, it, approximately two years ago, um, this building was constructed without permits, went to Planning Commission. Planning Commission uh, decision was for the building to be removed. It was appealed to council. Correct. Council concurred with the Planning Commission. Correct. That the building should be removed. 
And this became a code enforcement action? Correct. So for the last two years, this has been an unresolved code case? Correct. Comes to the Planning Commission, and when, when I read that on the agenda, it was, well, if you guys approve the relo, you know, the relocation, I'll, I'll move it. And it kind of left it open as, that's kind of how it read on the agenda to me, but it's a, if you don't approve it, I don't know if I'm going to move it or not. Well, the, the, what came to the Planning Commission was a, and I might be talking about something different, so if I am, okay. I apologize, but there was a statement from the city attorney that said that if the Planning Commission chooses to approve this, that's a resolution of the legal action that's already been started against the property owner, and that legal action would then stop if it got approved by the Planning Commission. Was that you, Colin? Yes, it was, and there was also a provision that was made clear to the applicant during the hearing that the applicant, we'd also be requesting our attorney fees for bringing the code action. I guess what troubles me is it took, you know, nothing happened for two years, but the direction of city council was remove the building, and that direction was ignored for two years. Well, that's there, not true. Well, not true. As a, ignored Had as been a, ignored by the home right staff property. Did that's not ignored. It. No, and I'm not inferring that you ignored it. All right. That it was ignored by the property owner for two years till this application was made. And I and I do not want to say that the property owner ignored it because in that time they were working with staff to try and resolve the issue. Um, but there was a series of events that occurred. Uh, a letter was sent by me to the property owner giving them a deadline to remove it. Uh, didn't get removed. They got cited once, didn't get removed, got cited twice, didn't get removed. Then it was given to the city attorney to take legal action. A uh, demand letter was sent to them that had to be removed and ultimately they had to start um, court proceedings and then um, we got what we have here. So if this moves forward, Colin, you can weigh in. Are, are we going to be reimbursed all our attorney's fees along with double permit fees and everything else that goes along with it? Yes. I think I'd like this one to come back for further discussion also. It, uh, only because of our original direction that remove it first. I'm, I'm still a little troubled with why we take an application when something hasn't been corrected first. You know, we should clear the board before we go to the next step. And I'll, maybe, maybe I'll second that. Comment on I'll that. second that motion because it seems like somehow or another we're playing Monty Hall here with this situation. Yeah, it's we let's wanted make to a deal. make it. Make, let's make a deal, and that wasn't the direction that this council gave at that time. So it's, I'll second that. It's been properly moved and seconded. Under to, discussion. Yes. Um, I asked because it was a 3-2 vote. That's what was confusing. Um, I don't know about bringing it back. I'll support if you guys want to, but the reality is, is that at this point it goes to court, correct? No, it, if the Planning Commission action is upheld, what has to happen is the property owner has to tear it down and move it and rebuild it at the approved new location. And we would, and the city attorney would seek uh, fees to cover the court costs, and then they would pay double fees for their building permits. Is the way it stands right now. So, what would our action just um, just as a question? What would it mean to bring it back to us? I mean, what would be the purpose? Well, to me, it's we told them to take it down. I mean, they have to start all over again. Essentially, they 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 have gone on for almost two years and not done that. I don't want to be punitive, but at the same time, uh, this thing should have been, you tell me in the planning, again, we only work with these short notes, you tell me they've already approved it, so it was moved, and there is no violation with the PACA there that's in that property, like it was before? It has not been moved yet. Nothing's happened. 
Nothing's happened. It's still in the wrong location. The way it was approved, it has to be torn down and moved and rebuilt at the approved new location. But the way it stands right now is not in the right location where it was illegally built Correct. to begin with. Is there a time limit on this thing for them to do it? Or a performance contract with it? The building permit is typically given six months when it's, when it's issued. I'll defer to Councilman Newton who's his original motion, but I still think we're playing Monty Hall. I'm not comfortable with it. I'd, I'd, I'd like to see that come before us. Um, just some, something doesn't sit right with me, Steve, on this. Madam Mayor, if I could comment on the... What's going to happen at this point? Assuming the, if the council wants to take it back, that's completely the council's prerogative to hear it. If, if the council didn't decide to hear it, what would happen is we would take the planning commission's conditions and we would put that into a judgment. And the judge would sign off on the judgment and we would demand that they reimburse the city for all the attorney fees. So they're going to get a hefty penalty for dragging this out just in paying the attorney fees. Because it's a judgment, if they don't actually follow through with what the Planning Commission said, we can have the judge enforce it immediately without having to go back through the court process. It's basically going to be a court order. So if they violate it, they're not just violating the Planning Commission, but they're in contempt of court. So we have options to really bring the hammer down once it becomes a judgment, if the council's comfortable with that. If you're not, it's completely your discretion to bring it up here and, uh, and discuss it at, at council level. I think I'd still like to discuss it, but taking in regard what, what the attorney's uh, saying. But at the same time, looking at the new proposed drawings, it, I wouldn't want to hit them again for fees because I, you know, looking at it that it's a permanent building in, in, in the proper location, I don't see where, you know, and judged by this action, planning wouldn't have an issue in approving it. So I, I don't want them to like resubmit again, but I think the first step is have that building down. But I need some more information, Steve. Now or on appeal? On appeal. So Colin, let me understand this so I'm clear. If it comes back to appeal to council, you're saying we're gonna lose our ability to get the to do what the Planning Commission did and continue with the court action then? Or we have the... That's correct. So then we'll be short if we won't have to get, we won't be able to get the court costs and the attorney fees from these people, correct? Well, we, we would be able to if we continue the case and ultimately prevail. Uh, this is essentially, the Planning Commission hearing was something close to a, a settlement discussion. And there was a tentative deal. That deal is obviously subject to the council's approval. We would just have to continue the court case. The bottom line is that they were in violation. They got notices to correct. They failed to correct. They've presented something to the Planning Commission that the council doesn't like. The council's not obligated to accept something. Um, we would just, it, if, the, if the council decided to withdraw the variance or uh, reverse the variance, then we'd simply continue down the court process. Did the resident agree to this that night? Yes. So, well, that, that may, that, for me, that makes it different. The resident agreed. I mean, I guess the, I kind of, I, I do feel like we need to give them a shot at keeping their word. So, and for, we are working through the final details of the settlement agreement with the resident's attorney. So, I don't have a complete document to tell the council this is it. But I, I can represent to the council that unless we come back and get your permission. We're not going to put anything in front of the judge unless they pay 100% of the fees to reimburse the, the city. And also, we put it as part of a judgment that they comply with each and every one of the Planning Commission's conditions. Colin? And Steve, have they, we haven't issued any permits yet, have we? No. Okay. Have they made application? Not for building permits, no. Because they have to wait for approval first and then submit for okay. building permits. I trust you, okay? No permits issued to until paid in full. Would that be reasonable? Attorney's fees and the double permit fees? I think it's reasonable, yes. It would be cleaner if we kept the two tracks separate so that the planning department could 
proceed with their planning approval process as a as a separate action and we take that approval process and put it into the judgment. Once it's in the judgment, we can enforce the attorney fee provision through contempt or we can file it on the property. But he would have a building permit at the time. You know, we'll make that part of the uh, we'll make that part of the judgment demand that you pay the attorney fees before. And all permit fees and attorney's fees paid before we issue any permits. He has received he has received the variance. So that that has occurred it's, unless the unless the council reverses that. So at this point he has that he has that right. This is not a variance. I'm sorry. Thank you. The uh, just thank you. Plan. He has received a certain right from the commission that unless the council hears it and reverses it, he has. Building permits, I'd have to talk to Steve more about the what the prerequisites are for getting a building permit. There might be some ministerial issues there that we don't have discretion to deny it on, and there, there may be some discretionary portions, but I'm, I'm just not, I haven't discussed it enough with Steve to find out if we could say at this point, we're not going to give you a building permit, it might be required by the code. I can tell you that any order and settlement of the case is going to have an attorney fee requirement in it that they pay. And we can even make them pay before we dismiss the case and submit the settlement. I just, I just feel this is going to drag on. And part of my hesitation on this is that in the past, we've had uh, cases that are open code cases with fines and penalties due, and we issue another permit to that homeowner for another project. So we're, we're hung out. And it, it's that's why I'm kind of dragging on this one. As I and, as I and I think that's this, a stupid road to go down that way. <laughs> as I explain this, I can feel the same thing that you're feeling. Okay, I, I understand where you're coming from. I, I think that your your concerns are valid. <laughs> <laughs> but as a, as a practical matter, that's though, shocking. <laughs> it would not be issued building permits without first paying the fees. That right. is our process. Right. So that part should be taken care of. But the attorney's the fees, attorney should fees be is what we'll be left with. Tied with that. How do I get there? You're a smart guy. Well, we can <laughs> demand the check before we submit the dismissal, so that they're at least still in court in a live case. But frankly, if they agree to a judgment, and we put the judgment in, and it, it's filed as a judgment, they can be dismissed or not. If they don't pay the fees, we can bring them back on a contempt hearing. Let me think, Ted. Well, I don't want to be hung out with nothing because of all the time that the attorneys in code enforcement has done in this case. We have to recoup some of those costs, even though the applicant has and burdened us with those costs. Uh, so I'd rather have something at this point. And if we come back here, that's where I'm afraid we're going to end up uh, starting back over square one. And that's the sad part. And I'm glad you clarified that for me. Because I was to, to the point where tear the dang thing down like we told you two years ago and, and get right with us. But if you're going to make it right with us and we're going to recruit some of those fees, then I'm okay with that. But I hope that it's strongly worded in the agreement and that his people don't issue permits unless those fees come through as part of this. And that's where the people at the counter have to know that. Now, would I need to, we need to be clear here. Once they pay their building permit application fees and they've submitted their plans and been approved, we have no way to stop that process from going forward. Like Colin said, the, the, the recovery of the legal costs is a separate path. It is. That's correct. So if we if we is, if we don't hear the planning commission's action on appeal, and they get their permit, they could theoretically snub their nose and say, "I'm not going to pay your fees," and we'd have to take them all the way to a trial to get our fees. But I am. I can tell the council there's going to be no settlement unless they agree to the, agree to the fees, and if they don't, we'll just take them to trial for the fees. We're back to that. Let's make a deal. Yeah, then. let's back and we're going to settle yeah. on fees and, okay. and all of that. I won't. So it's frustrating because I'm going to I'm going to trust you, Colin, that that you and the staff there do do your job on this one because it's very frustrating. <coughs> so 
how I'm and, and I still have a hard time accepting why you they can make their application for the building permit <coughs> but you're not obligated to or I don't understand that obligation that you'd have to give them a building permit even though they owe us money well the attorney fees are a separate issue from the building permit courts deal with attorney fees, except for in a, a special type of administrative nuisance abatement, which we're not in. Right. So the court basically has jurisdiction over the fees. The city has jurisdiction over the permits and granting the permits and the building permits. So they really are on separate tracks, even though one impacts the other. In other words, the permits impact the actual settlement in court. They really are two separate issues. Court is just, is there a nuisance? Do we need the judge to issue an injunction demanding they clean up the nuisance? And do we get our attorney fees? That's what is at issue in court. At issue with the city is, are they zoned correctly? Do they have the correct permits? Have they paid their permitting fees? We are settling the case by taking care of both at the same time. They are going to get the proper permits. They're going to get the proper approvals. They're going to pay attorney fees. And we're going to get rid of the nuisance case all in one big bundle, which is a settlement agreement, which is going to be entered as a judgment that's going to be enforceable by the judge. Unfortunately, they, we have to have some, it, it could turn out to be a situation where they basically go back and say, you know what, I know we didn't say this during the planning commission hearing, but we're not going to pay your attorney fees, take us to trial, and thanks for the permit. And that would be an extremely frustrating situation where I'd have a bunch of egg on my face. And I don't put it past, I'm not saying that that thought hasn't occurred to me. I think I can get the council to where the council needs to go, I think I can get us a good res resolution on this, but there has to be, there is some actions that the other side could take that makes things a little bit more difficult. But at the end, it might be a little more difficult. I think I can still get us to where we need to be. Because basically, they're innocent. Until they agree and go to court and it's adjudicated, they're innocent. So right now, per what Planning Commission came up with, they have agreed, right, to exactly what Colin just laid out. Otherwise, they're innocent. They're not guilty of anything. I mean, they, they go before a judge, and we've all seen it before. And the judge says, oh, gee, I feel sorry for you. And, you know, Norco has stupid codes, so, you know, that's where we're at. So I think, personally, I think we let Colin do his tap dance, and uh, let's make a deal, and hopefully they pick window three. And if, but if they... I'll go with you if you want to bring it back. <clears throat> Colin, you're a smart guy. I've known you for a long time, <laughs> and, I, and I trust your opinion. How much are our attorneys' fees at a road? Thirty-four hundred. I can get that out of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, are you going to withdraw your yeah. motion? Yes, Mayor. Okay. So do we have another motion? Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve um, item, I guess, 2C, part 2. Please vote. Motion passes unanimous. All right, thank you. We'll move to um, item 2G. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, this is a, a, a resolution requesting your approval uh, for management uh, employees' uh, salary, annual salary and benefits uh, for fiscal year 2019 2020. Uh, the current uh, uh, salary resolution and, and benefits resolution has will expire on June 30th. Uh, the employees that are covered under this uh, resolution are management employees, which are essentially department heads. 
and that is they are considered as uh, executives and that's, uh, that's the reason I put this out of consent calendar so that I can uh, make a small presentation regarding the, the salary resolution. Essentially, uh, the what you're being asked to approve this evening uh, for fiscal year 2019-2020 is uh, the same benefits that are currently in existence for all of those employees. The only item being requested here is uh, to adjust the salary range by 3%, uh, which is uh, the consumer price index uh, uh, for the last 12 months. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the uh, position of the uh, finance director is recommended to be uh, Currently, finance officer. We are recommending that that position be changed to the director of finance instead of uh, finance officer. That's just that is just a title change. Uh, with respect to the public works uh, director position, uh, we are recommending that the salary range be adjusted from 132,741 to 150,485 dollars uh, to properly re reflect uh, the the mark the market. Uh, salary uh, for that position, um, especially given um, what other cities are paying uh, for that particular position. Um, with that, again, the costs related to this uh, adjustment have been included in the uh, budget that you will be approving later on in this, uh, in this uh, meeting. And with that, I can take any questions from any members of the city council. Do any members of the council have questions? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. There's second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve item 2G. Please vote. Display. Motion approved, unanimous. Thank you. At this time, if you guys will allow me the little leeway, we're gonna go ahead and um, go out of order and call uh, Mr. De Rosa back up for our presentation. Our um, guest from Ace Hardware is here, so if you wouldn't mind coming up again. Run over here. Well, I hope you get to enjoy the read this again. <laughs> so um, I'm going to skip the good evening part, but um, we're here to go ahead and present Ace Hardware with the Business Appreciation Award for uh, uh, June 2019. And um, what I had said earlier was that I don't believe that there's anything more traditional than a family-owned neighborhood hardware store in a small rural town. I believe most everyone in the Norco, in Norco is familiar with the local Ace Hardware Store and the personalized service they provide. The Norconians Michael and Nicolina Brand opened their Ace Hardware franchise in 1977 and it has become a staple in our small town. Now owned by their daughter Nancy Shepard and managed by Joe Centeno, who's been working there since the beginning. Our local Ace Hardware continues to be that small mom and pop shop to go to when you need hardware for your home or ranch. They also support many charities and community events as well as employing local residents. So congratulations to Ace Hardware for being the recipient of NERCO's 2019 Business Appreciation Award. Mayor Grimmeyer. So it's my pleasure to present to you this uh, plaque that reads that the City of Norco honors Ace Hardware for its local ownership's commitment to personalized service consistent with hometown values of Horsetown, USA. Thank you. Um, I do receive this in, in um, 
in the name of uh, Michael and, and Nikki Brandy. They were the owners. Um, they did open up, as, it, as mentioned, in August of 1977. I came to work for them the day after Christmas that same year. Of course, I was five years old when I started. <laughs> no, sorry, I just graduated high school. But I've been there forever, just haven't been able to find my way away. Um, my family's been there since 62, so we've been Norconians for a long, long time. Um, it was a blend of a business. I mean, I also have to give credit to Mr. Vandermullen because he was our competitor for many years. But then what he did is he decided he wanted out of that business and we had two businesses that merged. So we went from having ranches being helped and homeowners being helped to being able to combine for both. And we just thank you so much for accepting us into this family and this community. And uh, it is that little hometown thinking that we try to keep. Instead of allowing corporate ace to tell us, hey, carry this, carry that, we uh, tailor our merchandise and all that our stock we have for what our market is here. And um, I'm always willing that if you guys have a need and I have the ability to get it for you, I'll stock it. And that's always been the philosophy that we've had over at Narco. So thank you very much for this. And we, you know, we see this as really as an honor. And we thank you so much for this privilege to serve your community and be in family. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at this time we're going to go to agenda item number four, which is public comments. This is the time when persons in the audience wishing to address the city council regarding matters not on the agenda may speak. Please complete the speaker card in the back of the room and present it to the city clerk so that you can be recognized. The Ralph M. Brown Act limits the city council's ability to respond to comments on non-agenda agendized matters. At the time such comments are made, the city council shall not discuss or take take action relative to any of the public comment. We have one speaker card, Gary Yellis. Good evening. Uh, I got three minutes, so I'll go to the, my biggest complaint. The light on 6th Street in Pedley. Come on now, that's been blinking like that for three, four weeks. You got two minutes one way, you got one minute the other way. All your diesel trucks, they pull up there to turn carrying cattle. They just turn on the red light. You guys, you can make a lot of money. Come park in my driveway. I ask you, please, come park in my driveway at 4.30 in the morning. You'll get these guys 70, 80 miles an hour going down Pedley. You don't even have to ask me. Just park there. Uh, I went to the people up front here and also the uh, uh, animal, uh, the pound. I, I had some things I needed to work out and they bent over backwards to help me. Those people need maybe a few more cents on their paycheck. They, they went out of their way and I'm just a nobody. That's the first time I ever walked in there. So you got good people working for you. Uh, Oh, uh, on Pedley, they uh, just repaved it, and there's some new plastic fences at the far end, the north end. We want to know if you're going to do that all the way along, because my lovely wife bought two loads of rocks, so I moved them out there. Now I already moved them back, figuring you're going to come through and tear everything up. A guy would like to know at my age. Uh, are, are you going to do it or not? I've asked many people, and nobody, oh, I don't know. I'll ask somebody. Come on, somebody's got to have an opinion of what's going on here. 
I mean, and you guys, this young man here and you guys get a pot of coffee, homemade cookies, call that guy with that building, you sit down, you talk, you get it over with. Yeah, what I'm hearing here is just attorney stuff. Well, we'll delay it. Well, we'll delay it. Well, it costs more. Come on, get together. You sit down. That's what I do when I buy something. Isn't that what you do when you buy a horse? You sit down, you figure it out, it's overdone with. You don't stretch it out. And, oh yeah, tell your school bus drivers and Hollandia Dairy to slow down down Pedley. They come on there and they just, it's a drag strip going down there. I've tried to say that many times and nobody's ever listened to me. Um, oh, and there's a house on Detroit. There's like 10 or 12 cars parked there. I think one moves. It's way off to the back. There's weeds all over. Don't, aren't we proud of Norco? Wouldn't that be a good thing to go over there and just ask the people, hey, can you spruce this place up a bit? Everybody across the street, they're beautiful homes. They're smaller and everything. They take care of it. You know, a little comment might help from you guys. Oh yeah, put some speed bumps out here so these people from the Navy, when you're coming out from Stater Brothers to turn and they're getting off work, they just buzz right through. That's another place you guys can make some money there too. God, you sit there for five, ten minutes. They don't stop. They just slow up, go through the stop sign. You know, I drive 25, 27 miles an hour around here, but a lot of people don't. So, let's see. I think that's about enough right now. Thank I, you, sir. Your I think I might come back for another Your term. time's up, but you can come back at the next meeting with another list. Thank you. And questions about fencing? You can see Mr. Blaze right here. He has the schedule. He'd be happy to talk to you about the schedule. Right. Do it after the meeting while we're all here. It'll be fine. Okay. Uh, no other cards? No? No further comment cards. All right, thank you. So we are going to move to item number five. Um, and we only have one, so it's discussion and action items. On these, we have an order of presentation for our discussion items. We'll have a staff report and presentation. We'll have council questions of staff. We will take uh, public speakers. We'll have council discussion and then uh, council action, which for this particular item is appointments to various city commissions and um, EDAC, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about that. Um, so with that, we will have our report from the city clerk. Thank you, Mayor. Um, tonight we are discussing, as you said, the appointments to various city commissions and the um, Economic Development Advisory Council. Um, we do have eight scheduled vacancies. Two are unscheduled um, for this um, opening. EDAC um, had an unscheduled vacancy with Susan Olmstead Bowen. Historic Preservation Commission was Teresa Edwards and Matthew Potter. Parks and Recreation Commission, Richard Hallam and Jeff Cahan was an unscheduled. The Planning Commission was Danny Acevedo. Streets, Trails, and Utilities Commission was Michael Thompson, Gary Schoen, William Naylor, and Sherry Walker. The requirements, um, the Norco Municipal Code Chapter 2.22.040 requires that you must be a citizen of the United States, be a permanent resident of the city, be at least 18 years of age, take and file with the city clerk the oath required by Section 36507 and the California Government Code, and no felony conviction. The current recruitment, the public notice was released April 2019. The application deadline was June 10th, 2018. A total of 13 applicants received, applications were received, excuse me. There were no applications received for the Economic Development Advisory Committee. 
Um, and we're hoping to have that recruitment extended. The report said June 24th, but that is actually Monday. When I wrote the report, that seemed far away. But if we could um, extend to July 10th and hopefully receive applications by then and go to council on July 17th to make a determination for EDAC. Um, the current applicants um, for historic preservation, we have two vacancies, was Teresa Edwards, who is the incumbent. Oh, I'm sorry. And Carolyn Morse, Parks Recreation Commission. We have two vacancies. We have um, applicants Kathy Burt, Katie Cover, William Naylor. The Planning Commission, we have one vacancy, Danny Acevedo, which is the incumbent. Streets, Trails, and Utilities Commissions, we have four vacancies and we've received seven applications. And it was Thomas Dames, John Futrell, William Naylor, who's an incumbent, Gary Schoen, incumbent, Michael Thompson, incumbent, Sherry Walker, incumbent, Mike Williams. And at this time, you would have um, public comment if any of the applicants are here to speak, and then we'll take a vote. Okay. Real quick, does council have any questions of staff? I have one. Uh and we'll probably do it and you'll know, cover on the election. On the ones that have uh, re the short replacements that we have, uh, the unfulfilled, um, uh, yeah, unscheduled, thank you, I knew the word, <laughs> unscheduled vacancies, how are you going to determine uh, on the voting uh, which one of those gets that? You know what, I'm sorry. Um, with the unscheduled vacancy, since we only have um, two, I think, for the Parks and Recreation Commission, um, we have the, um, we would have to um, make that determination. I'll have to look into that. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer. Okay, I'm right just uh, yeah, I'd have to double check okay. on that. All right, thank you. Any other questions of staff? So, Dana, do you want us to make a motion to go ahead and extend the deadline for EDAC just right off the top and Correct. get that done for if you? Correct. If we can do that first, and then we will go to voting on um, the applicants. Yeah, after public comment, right? Correct. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to extend the recruitment period for EDAC until July 10th, 2019. So it's been properly moved and seconded to extend recruitment for EDAC. Uh, oh, discussion, under discussion. Real quick. Yeah. It, it, are we having is EDEC meet here at the end of the month? Yes. The commission. Okay, so they'll have time to get further. Go yes. find out their through their own members for an recruitment. Process. We'll be we'll be sending out some emails to um, other applicants from different commissions that were not chosen to maybe um, bring them on board for EDEC. And that and past EDEC applicants. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Please vote. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So then we are going to go ahead and move on to public speakers uh, for this discussion item. So our first card. The first speaker is Bill Naylor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the privilege of being able to serve on the Streets, Trails, and Utilities Commission for the last four years. I learned a lot, and I hope that we were able to do a number of good things within the city. I know we did, actually. Uh, I also want to let you know why I got but there are, I requested to be on the streets, trails, and utilities because I am an avid horse rider and I do a lot of patrol riding throughout the state and I do routinely ride the trails here in Norco and then observe issues and try to report those and get those fixed. We were actually able to start a volunteer program through the Parks and Recreation program and the city to be able to help maintain the trails. 
Second of all, I'd like to let you know that I have applied for um, the streets, trails, and utilities again as an incumbent, but I would also like you to consider uh, letting me switch over to the Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, again, I'm very interested in the equestrian area, and just, uh, Parks and Recreation does take care of about a third of the trails in Norco, so it would not be a far-fetched thing for me to just be switching from one commission to the other. Um, I do enjoy working with Parks and Recreation. I have 25 years of experience in that area, and I have had an opportunity to work with everything from sports leagues to uh, the city zoo to uh, uh, facility rentals and equipment rentals, all that kind of stuff. So I really feel that I could be a real asset to the Parks and Recreation Commission. If I have a choice, that would be the commission I would prefer to be on, but I did put in an application for both, and I'd like to be able to serve in one way or the other again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker, Mike Williams. Thank you, Mayor, Council, staff. Um, my name is Mike Williams. I'm a 10 year resident of the city of Norco, and I did uh, submit application for the Streets, Trails, and Utilities Commission. Uh, I feel that this is a good time for me after living here for 10 years. I've got a, a fair idea about how this city operates. Uh, I've got 40 years of transportation experience, so streets, highway safety, so on is, is a good push for me. And I've got a lot to add there, I think. Uh, as an equestrian, uh, I'm involved with the Nash, uh, uh, Forest Service, Pacific Crest Trail Association, Backcountry Horsemen. Uh, of course, we just did our little ride from Norco to Bishop, and in pre-riding all of that, 15 to 20 miles uh, on some days that we never left the city. So I got to see a lot in the city of Norco as far as trails went. And I think I've got a lot to offer there. Uh, I'm anxious to work with the council and with the staff and with the city of Norco. I want to work with the citizens. I'm sure that many of the citizens that aren't anxious to be in front of everyone like this, uh, behind the scenes, they've got a lot of good ideas. And I appreciate the opportunity, and I ask for your support in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeff Cahan. <laughs> Tough crowd out there. Yes. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to address on this topic. First of all, I want to thank you for allowing me to serve on the Parks and Rec Commission for seven years. Um, just due to some personal and family obligations, I felt it was necessary that I step down. So. Because of me, you have an unscheduled vacancy. Uh, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Katie Cover. She's in Washington, D.C. She's not here to personally uh, present herself. I believe she emailed you, though. And I, um, I've worked with her on the uh, Parade of Lights and Christmas Festival Committee. And uh, she's taken over for Pat Overstreet on uh, organizing all the different parades in town. I think she would be a fantastic asset. And I would recommend that you consider her to fulfill my final year on the short uh, vacancy. And then uh, I uh, wholeheartedly endorse Bill Naylor uh, to move over. I think with his 25 years of Parks and Rec experience, he would be a fantastic asset to Parks and Rec. And then that would also open up a fantastic opening for Mike Williams uh, with his background uh, with Backcountry Horseman and all of his other uh, equestrian and, and uh, trail experience, he'd be a fantastic asset for streets and trails. So I would uh, ask that you would consider those recommendations and uh, thank you again for allowing me to serve the city. Our next speaker is Teresa Edwards. Hello, Mayor and Council. Um, I just want to say real quick that I've really been honored to be on the Historic Preservation Commission the last four years. It went really fast. And uh, I feel like uh, we're just getting started. So uh, I appreciate your consideration. I'd be honored again to continue the work. And we have lots of things that we want to do for Anarcho. Uh, as far as Carolyn's concerned, she's not here. She wants to be here, but she's camping at the river with her family. And um, we were texting this afternoon, and she's just really eager to be on this commission with us. She's really great. Um, she found us, basically. 
when we were doing the exhibit for the first horse week, our first horse week exhibit in April, we put up a bunch of displays and stuff and then we had the exhibit open that weekend and Diane Stiller, one of our commission members, posted some pictures of our exhibit on Facebook that same day, like in real time. And um, one of the items happened to be an article that Carolyn had written for Pony Express, like back in the 70s. And she saw that on the Facebook page. So next thing we know, she's walking in with her two granddaughters, walks right up to the poster and says, that's me. And we're like, that's incredible, you know? And uh, she never left. She's been coming in every Friday when we work, and she said, I'm here to work, and she's got a lot of skills. And we're just so overjoyed to have her as an applicant. So thank you very much for everything, and um, you'll be hearing more from us in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker, Mike Thompson. Good evening, Council. And uh, wow, I can't believe how fast this four-year term that you allowed me to t serve on has gone by so fast. But as we got a, as a long-term resident, 35 years, and before the freeway, and an ex-equestrian, retired, I have got a, still got a lot of work to do. As we're been working on backyard trails and the situation with where we just made a really good trail plan. Some of the trails that were questionable have disappeared and whatnot. I'd like to continue on a lot of that work and I hope that I can continue to be a voice for some of the other residents in town who are not going to move because they've retired and their horses have gotten old and retired. And I think that's something I have to offer and I'd like to continue on this commission and uh, keep the city of Norco moving in the direction for all the citizens and uh, continue the lifestyle as much as difficult as it's getting to, to keep. So thank you for your support. Thank you. There are no further comment cards. Okay, very good. So we'll bring it back up. Is there any discussion from council? All right. So, uh, you guys have your ballots in front of you, correct? Dana? Everybody should have your ballot in front of you. If okay. you'd please vote. And I'll collect those when you're complete. I have three. No, I it have was just two, if there was so. a tie. Or if you made a mistake, <laughs> I gave you extras. <laughs> Okay, real quick, uh, colleagues up here. Uh, Andy just asked if we want to determine uh, who will do the short terms now. And is it just the, we're just looking at the one unscheduled vacancy, right, on Parks and Rec, so we're just looking at, at that particular Correct, because the spot. other unscheduled would be the EDACT. Okay. So Parks and Rec, correct. And I was just reading, yeah, you can make the determination now. Um, it's up to you to vote on who you would like to fill that position if we're unscheduled. So what's the pleasure of the council for filling the one-year term? Whoever gets the lowest vote. Is that agreeable to everyone, whoever gets the lowest vote? You don't have that computer program, so... So that's good? If it's a tie, flip a coin. That's what I think. It flip a coin if it's a tie. Yeah, but you got it too big. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so everybody's agreeable to that? I'll take that as a yes. That's what we'll do. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. We have the results for the Historic Preservation Committee. Teresa Edwards, the incumbent, received five yes votes. Historic Preservation Committee member for Carolyn Morse received five yes votes. So both have been voted in for their vacancies. For Parks and Recreation Commission, you were to vote for two. Katie Cover had five yes votes. William Naylor had four yes votes. Kathy Burt had one yes vote. So Katie Cover will take the full position and William Naylor will take out the final unscheduled with his four votes. Planning Commission, Danny Acevedo, the incumbent, had five yes votes. For Streets, Trails, and Utilities Commission, we had Gary Schoen, the incumbent, with five yes votes. Michael Thompson, the incumbent, with three yes votes. Sherry Walker, the incumbent, with five yes votes. Mike Williams, with five yes votes. William Naylor, the incumbent, had one and Thomas Doms had one. So the four that have been chosen for Streets Trails is Gary Schoen, Michael Thompson, Sherry Walker, and Mike Williams. And that's the end of the vote. All right, thank you.
So at this time we're going to move on to agenda item number six and I would ask my colleagues um, in looking at the audience and looking at the time if we could take these items out of order and go to item C and then take a break before we go to the items A and B. So is that okay with staff and council? Is everybody okay with that? Yep. The public hearing for uh, the permit from Animal Control first. Frank, is that okay with you? <laughs> All right. Excellent. So we'll go ahead and take the agenda out of order. We're going to go to item 6C, which is an approval of a wild, vicious animal permit. Um, and this is a public hearing, so I just want to review kind of the order and the protocol for everyone. We'll have a staff report and presentation. Council will then ask their questions of staff. I will open the public hearing, and that time public can submit cards um, and have their three minutes apiece. We'll close the public hearing. We'll bring it back to council for discussion, and then council will take their action. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and City Council members. Uh, before you tonight is an application request for a Norco Wild Vicious Animal Permit. To give you a little facts and history on this. Uh, facts on March 9th, 2019, Los Angeles County Department of Animal Care and Control notified the City of Norco that an Australian cattle dog mix named Maverick was in our jurisdiction and was deemed potentially dangerous and was released to Northwest Boxer Rescue in Woodenville, Washington. Uh, Northwest Boxer Rescue adopted and transferred ownership of that dog to Robert Stern, a resident of Norco. By this transfer of the potentially deemed dangerous dog falls under the city of Norco jurisdiction and its codes. Under Norco Code Section 8.05, with any domesticated animal deemed wild or vicious, the owner must submit a Norco Wild or Vicious Animal Permit application to Norco Animal Control requesting the animal to reside within Norco city limits. <laughs> This process requires a hearing by the city council to approve the permit, and so here we are. <laughs> we have two maps here for your uh, review. The, app, um, the location map. Green one there. Oh. Okay. The green button. Green button, there we go, okay. The location map here, this is where the, the resident resides at. This is 2993 Hillside Avenue. Over here to the right is a zoning map, so you can see that the house is uh, R110, which is a residentially zoned, and it's surrounded by A120, which is an agriculturally zoned area. Based on the application, staff conducted an investigation as to the evaluation and conclusions reached by Los Angeles County Department of Animal Care and Control regarding the dog. Norco Animal Control also inspected the property where the dog will be housed, evaluated the animal and provided recommendations and conditions for the city council to consider if the, uh, in the application for the permit. Findings. The dog Maverick was deemed potentially dangerous by Los Angeles Co County Department of Animal Care and Control as a result of three dog bites whereby the dog got off the property and bit three different individuals. As a result of the bites, Los Angeles County Department of Animal Care and Control deemed the dog potentially dangerous based on the previous owner waiving his rights to a hearing. The proposed wild animal vicious permit is for an Australian cattle dog mix and is allowable under the Norco Municipal Code Chapter 8.05, but is conditioned based on the City Council approval of the permit within the City of Norco limits. Determination. Based on the evaluation from the dog owner's trainer, staff's evaluation, along with the city's contract evaluator, Dog on Fun, Maverick has shown no signs of aggression towards people or animals as noted in the Dog on Fun evaluation and observation, which is part of the staff report, Exhibit E. Maverick has completed over 40 hours of dog training with the owner's trainer, along with a third-party expert trainer approved by the city dog on fun who has provided an evalu evaluation and observation letter which is part of the staff report. Maverick has continued to be socialized on and off the property while accompanied by a leash and cage muscle as part of his ongoing training conditions and requirements. 
North Island Patrol Services has deemed that the applicant's property is in good repair and has provided safeguards and redundancies to house the canine. So let's go over some of those redundancies with an aerial view of the home that staff has created. So uh, this is a staff created slide. This uh, shows the, the dwelling here, the front yard and grass area. Uh, the orange dots or dashes here uh, indicate a chain link fence. The purple here is an electric fence that opens up to get in and out of the property. Again over here this dark brown area would be a wooden fence that surrounds most of the property. And on this back wall here, this is a, a center block wall. Uh, we have a crate here where the dog will be kept while the owner is gone inside the house. We also have two other additional kennels, uh, one here on the side of the house and then a, a back one which is approved by North Ground Patrol because it has a top, it's under a patio and it has a cement bottom so he can't dig out or climb out. So for example, um, if the dog was uh, in the house uh, for it to get onto the street, it would have to get out of the crate, somehow get out of the house. If it got into the backyard, we'd have to go through this chain link fence, this wooden fence, and then this chain link fence to get to the street. Um, if it was already uh, got out of the crate and got into the front yard, you still have the chain link fence and for him to get out onto the street. So those are the redundancies set up to keep the dog from getting to the public. Here's an example of the homeowner as we are approaching the house. This here is the electric gate with the solar panel right here. Here's the back side of the electric gate showing the mechanism that opens the gate right here. This is an example of the front yard. This is on the south side of the house where there's a, a chain link gate in, in order to get into the backyard. This is on the north side of the property where there's a wooden fence uh, separating the backyard from the front yard and there's also a kennel just on the other side of that wooden fence as you'll see shortly. This is an example of the backyard of the property. Dog kennel on the north side of the property, no top or cement floor. So this is an example of the kennel. Um, back here would be that earlier picture where you saw the wooden fence. This is a closer view of that same kennel. It's, it has a dirt floor and no top to it. This is the one approved by Animal Control. This uh, dog kennel has a cement floor, has a top to it that's enclosed, and it's underneath a patio to keep it uh, away from the elements. And it measures uh, six feet high by five feet wide by five feet long, although in the picture it doesn't look that big, <laughs> but it is. There's pictures of Maverick with the owner. Uh, we asked her to bring him out of the house and present him to us. Maverick was well behaved that day. There's an example of the crate that will be used uh, to house Maverick inside the house, as you saw in earlier slides. Recommendation conditions of approval. Staff has reviewed the recommend recommendations and conditions with the applicant, and the applicant has indicated that they agree with the conditions, but would ask for a reduction in the limits of liability to $300,000. The Wild Vicious Animal Permit has been reviewed by the City Attorney and PERMA, our risk management group, who has recommended a million dollar general liability insurance policy listing Norco as an additionally insured with waiver of subrogation being taken out on the dog. That concludes my presentation. I'm here to answer any questions council may have. Also in the audience, we have the applicant uh, who has some information that she would like to provide. And I also have the dog trainer that provided multiple stress tests on the dog for the city of Narco here as well that can answer questions for you as well. Okay, excellent. Does council have any questions of staff? Yes. Uh, we'll start with Berwin. Frankie. Yes, sir. Good presentation. Uh, Looked like they got him pretty well secured and everything, but I got a question on the uh, the front gate. Okay. Of course, you can't tell by a picture, but uh, how much of a gap does it have between the bottom of the gate and the driveway? Well, let's let's back up and see if I can if I can do that. Is it enough for him to crawl under, or it no? It's a very small gap. Um, I I'd hate to guess, but I would say it's a few inches. There we go. Okay, go there we can. go. There's the gate. Um, the, the, the biggest area I would say would be over here, if you want to see the back side of it. There's not a whole lot there underneath the gate, maybe a few inches. 
I don't think the Queensland Hill could get underneath that, to be honest with you. Where the driveway is. Um, okay, well, I, like I said, the picture don't do not do it justice. It, it doesn't, and it's a, it's a gate that's a lever open, so the whole gate opens at once. Right. And then closes all at once. Okay, thank you. Frank? Yes. A good report. You're thank you. You're very well prepared. My question is this, that going over all this report, um, would you take this dog home to your family? Uh, initially, when I crossed my desk, I would say no, but because I've experienced the training the dog has gone through in our stress tests, this dog has turned around, and I do believe it deserves a second chance. Good. And I would take it home. Appreciate it. Thanks. No problem. Frank, I do have, I don't have an issue with a dog, because how did it get to, from a boxer program? Well, it, that was curious. that was the rescue that uh, rescued it. It's uh, a boxer rescue, but apparently they rescue other dogs other than boxers. And uh, Robette Stern was the person who adopted it from them, and she happened to be a Norco resident. And then we are here today to follow through with her getting that permit. I'm just curious. It didn't make any sense. It, it, it doesn't, but there's there's a lot of working, rescues out there. They're working that, cattle dogs. They have it. Yes. Sometimes they have energy, and they like that. But yeah. hey, that can be corrected. I, I don't have a problem with that. My issue comes back to the liability. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading your report here, and all the other cities uh, that have the liability insurance and the requirements. And our city attorney and I perma was wrecking a million dollar general liability insurance policy, listing the city of Norco as additional insured the waiver of subrogation being taken out on the dog. And the applicant is asking us to reduce that to 300,000. Correct, that was the original uh, requirements of LA County that she pu pull a $300,000 policy, which she did take out. Um, but our PERMA, our risk management group, uh, deemed it necessary to have a million dollar policy. Uh, again, that's up to you guys to review if you want to lessen that risk or or, or leave it alone. And, and I guess I'm going to go with Colin since you're in here and you're such a vocal guy tonight. Tell me why this young lady needs a million bucks and what's what, I mean, I, the city, I mean, we're, we're taking this, the five of us are going to make a decision for the city to accept the responsibility to allow this dog, this permit to be done. And I don't have an issue with the dog, but I do, I'm looking at the million dollar general liability. Can you explain to me why? Can I interject, Councilman Hoffman? Uh, the city attorney did not make, recommend the million dollars. Our Perma Risk Management Group recommended it. The city attorney reviewed the okay. application, reviewed the conditions, reviewed uh, the incident reports that we forwarded to them from LA County. It was Perma, the Risk Management Group, that recommended a million dollars to make sure that the city is thoroughly protected and added the waiver of segregation. Uh, in our discussions with them, it is strictly a business decision by the city council what they want to set at those limits of liability. Uh, our uh, LA County uh, was set at 300,000. There are other jurisdictions that are 300,000 or around that range. Uh, but that was our risk manager's recommendation, so we needed to bring it to you. That's okay, correct. well, I still want, since he, we pay him to sit up here, <laughs> and just his legal expertise on this is more or less as the million dollars or the 300,000. I mean, it's, we, the five of us are taking a risk if we approve this for the city. And that's what I just want to make sure that we're not putting our city financially out to risk. It, you're just the million versus the 300,000. I, I think is, I think the answer as an attorney is of course get a million, but the, the I've taken some pragmatic opinions before, and you have to take a look. You, you can't mitigate every risk there is. In this case, you have to think about what kind of damage is the dog going to do. And in a horrible case scenario, the dog could attack a child seriously. And if a child seriously attacked, you're looking at over $300,000. The chances of that you have to consider, you also have to consider the fact that cities generally have some immunities for granting permits. No immunity is ironclad. There's no way I can guarantee we won't get sued. We will if a dog gets attacked. I can't guarantee that the lawsuit won't be successful, although I think we have some solid defenses in that case. And looking at the risk, you know, a million's obviously better than 300,000, but from a, from a business perspective, 
you as a council are authorized to make the decision to lower it to 300000 I think that decision's probably a reasonable one if you decide to go that way. I, I, would, I wouldn't think that it was unreasonable or overly risky. It's just the council's decision to decide 300 versus a million. It is possible that you could have a case involving a million dollars worth of liability, but it's unlikely. Fair answer. Thank you. Ted. Go ahead. It, what I would suggest is uh, typically all businesses, a million dollars is a starting point on liability. Um, why don't we ask the the applicant what the cost impact is since she's buying the insurance of the three hundred thousand po dollar policy compared to the million dollar policy and i'm sure that's on our homeowners insurance at that i, probably a little I bit. don't and i agree with you yeah, I, I don't think it's that much of an impact but i'd like to know that come on up for a bit i'm sorry i I'm not going out of order. No, I don't think so because it says questions of staff and Frank had said that she's available to policy answer. Policy versus the million dollar policy, if you know that information. I, Go yeah, good, good evening. Um, I, don't, I don't know that answer. I don't know that answer um, as yet. I do know it might be problematic to get that much coverage based on his um, record. Uh, currently, I, I have the three hundred thousand. I'm good with that. It's all that's what was required to get the dog, so um, that's why we're trying to stay with that. I mean, I understand why you know you would want to the more coverage because more coverage is always better. But at the same time, I'm not sure that we can actually obtain it. If I can ask, how long have you had the dog right now? Uh, four months. Four months. Thank you. Kevin, you had a um, question? So I'm in the kid business. And I'll tell you, a dog bites a kid and it'll be way above $300,000. So my only concern is a kid reaching into your gate. Would the dog ever be in your front yard where without one of you watching? One of the stipulations set by Norco Animal Control is that he is not left in the front yard unattended. Okay, yeah, that's my just reaching through and petting the nice dog and yeah. right, I'm good, thank you. Just to add, the, there's a condition that the dog must be muzzled any time that it is socialized or off property. Does council have any other questions of the applicant at this time? Okay, so you're good. Okay, for thank now. you. Thank you. Does council have any other questions of staff at this time? Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. So, okay. thank you, Frank, for your report. You're welcome. So, at this time, I'm going to open the public hearing. Do we have any cards? Yes, we do. The first card is Ben Hartley. Thank you, Council. It's been a while since a few of you. Um, I just want to say I've actually met this dog and it is, I'm actually thinking maybe um, the owner pulled the okie doke on LA County and switched the dog because it is non-aggressive. It pretty much lays around. Um, <laughs> the uh, second thing I wanted to talk about was the uh, million dollar policy. I understand coming from a city, working with the city, I understand the city wants to cover itself. Um, but you're also signing the waiver. Um, so they're not only having to purchase a $300,000 um, insurance policy, which is on top of their homeowner's insurance. So it's above and beyond. So you, they technically have two policies, if I understand that correct. No, single? Okay. Um, but yes, the dog is extremely docile. So I don't think you're going to have any issues with this. So. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Wendy Hartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council and staff. And thank you, Madam Mayor, for rearranging the agenda so we could get this over and done with earlier. Um, I've known Robette five years and her, baby, her fur babies are her kids. Uh, Maverick, he is the luckiest dog in the world because she adopted him and rescued him and going through all of this 
horrible stuff to try to get this permit. And I don't understand why they have to have a million dollar policy. It, from what I understand, surrounding cities, it's 100,000 or 300,000, so a million thousand, or a million sounds excessive. My request is that you do issue the permit. If the permit is not issued, I don't know what other option Robert would have but to put the dog down. So Maverick's a really awesome dog, and she's given him a second life, and it's been here for four months with her, no incidents, so I'd like for her to get that permit. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Bonnie Slager. Well, <clears throat> I don't agree with the other speakers, but that's my right. Why would you do this when somebody has to have special insurance? The dog may or may not. I guess any dog would, but this dog does have a history and I have personal experience with a dog chewing up one of my horses, and it was not a pretty sight. The dog came over a six-foot block wall. If you look online, you will see that all the recommendations on aggressive dogs is aggressive dogs should never be in a populated area, and that's why rescue groups should always be in a more rural area. Aggressive dogs, dogs with a history of aggression, should never be in a populated area. I hope you choose not to warrant this, not to allow this. Thank you. The final speaker, Linda Tain. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Linda Tain, and I'm here in favor of Maverick. I met him when Robert first got him, and my first meeting with him was actually in her vehicle where he didn't know me, and I opened the back door and just stuck my hand in there, and he licked me. He's not aggressive, and being from a dog owner's perspective and raising Roddy's for 35 years. I know an aggressive dog when I see one and I feel that he has not shown the aggression and every time we've gone back training wise with any dog that's shown any aggression whatsoever, most of the time it's owner error. And with that, not knowing his background, not knowing his history, not knowing the owners that had him that turned him in and just discarded him because they didn't want to spend time with him to make him a good dog. I really feel that it's the right thing to do is to give him a chance, give Robert a chance to prove that he deserves to be here just like everyone else. Thanks. Thank you. We do have one more. Linda Dixon. Good evening. Uh, I know nothing about the dog. Um, the only, my only concern in seeing these slides, uh, we have raised and trained dogs for 50 years. And so we currently have dogs that could get out of that uh, chain link kennel. Um, they're wonderful, they're kind, they're sweet, they're wonderful, but they climb right over it. My only c uh, concern would be to put a top on it. We've had to put tops on uh, dogs just because we didn't want them to hang themselves after they try to climb out. But um, that was my concern, put a top on on the, uh, the kennels because if these dogs want to get out, uh, our kennels are on concrete and they're uh, six feet tall. And currently, our two dogs, uh, one of which is 12 years old, can climb right out. And then when they know they're mad, we're mad at them, they'll climb back in. So uh, that, that would be just uh, a preventative. But um, personally, if we had a dog with a reputation like that, uh, and we have had dogs that have been a little aggressive. Um, we never took a chance with that. Thank you. We do have Pete Dumatoff. Thank you, Mayor. 
council folks. Um, I live with Maverick and Robette. I was skeptical a little bit at first, going to LA County Shelter and potentially rescuing Maverick. Once we met him, and I met him and saw how he reacted, the paperwork on the kennel said he had no training. After basic commands that Robert gave Maverick through the chain link, because we couldn't have one-on-one -on -one with him, only through the chain link, he had commands. He could sit. He could roll over. He was up uh, upside down. He let us, you know, pet him through underneath the chain link. Um, and I'm like, hey, you know, we need to give this dog a chance. So we brought him home. And once everything kind of hit the fan, um, I said, we got to keep pushing forward. Uh, everything that Frank has presented has been phenomenal. Everybody did a great job in favor of Maverick. Um, Maverick is with us all times. We don't leave him in the yard alone. We don't, we have the kennels in the backyard for a reason. If we need them, they're there. But 100% of the time, the four months that we've had him, we don't leave him alone. If we have to go somewhere, he's in the house, in the kennel, in his crate. And we're not gone very long. I believe he deserves a chance and this permit. We don't know what happened with the old owner. It could have been a bad situation. It could have been, like our friend Ben said, that you know maybe something was switched, you know, dog for another dog, because the original owner maybe didn't want to give up a bad dog because he wanted a bad dog. A spe pure speculation. Um, He deserves a chance and allowing us to get this permit and giving us the opportunity to prove that he's a good dog would be phenomenal. Figure give us a chance. He hasn't done anything on our watch. And based on Frank's presentation and the information and videos that you have watched, I'm assuming you watched videos from his valuations, they're pretty, pretty stellar. And um, again, thank you for reviewing this and giving us the opportunity. We have Sigrid Williams. Good evening, Mayor, Council, staff. Listening uh, to the story about Maverick, uh, many breeds get a bad rap. So I did some real quick research while I was sitting here listening. For an insurance policy between $10,000 and $3,000 for a vicious dog, the deductible is $250 to $2,500, and that means your monthly payment for insurance is going to be roughly about $138 a month. $300,000 is the normal high rate. If you add anything more to that, you are now looking for a, a general liability umbrella policy of a million dollars. That can run a person up to $1,000 a year in addition to their normal policy. Also, the average claim in 2016, and again, I did the research just now, is about $33,000, so it does not go over $300,000. Please take that into consideration. Thank you. There are no further speaker cards. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing. We'll bring it back to council for discussion. Does council have any, Berwin? Thank you, Mayor. Well, I've owned about eight or nine of these dogs in my life. They have a long lifespan, take care of them. They can be a very aggressive dog. They require a lot of work and a lot of attention. I mean, you have to make them work to keep their energy level down. I've, I've never had one but one that uh, would ever attempt to bite anybody, and that was if he was in my truck and somebody come up and open the door to get in. But there's a lot of dogs that are very protective of their vehicles, not just the cattle dogs or whatever. But uh, I never had any other problem with any of them trying to bite or attack, but we worked, we worked with them all the time. We kept them busy, and uh, if, if he's been mishandled before, that was probably his problem. You know, a dog has to love his owner and who's handling him, and they have to understand what he, what he needs to uh, get by. So I have, uh, I 
I have no problem with uh, allowing them to keep the dog. I talked to Frankie. I read all the report and everything, and Frankie told me what a, a turnaround the dog had done just in the last few months here. So that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Councilman Hoffman. I'm reading this, the recitals on from LA, and <clears throat> the, there are three attacks documented. They were children that were attacked by a dog, by a two-year-old dog. That dog's a year older now, because that happened last year. Uh, like Berwin, we used to use these dogs all the time on the dairy, and they love to work, and that's what they do. They, that's, they nip at the heels. That's what they're trained for. That's the nat's natural breeding. Yeah, we used to use them all the time to get the big bulls out of the breeding pens at Excelsior, because um, we didn't want to go in there. Um, and we have to put them up at night because they would continue to work. And they are a working dog. We used to use them up in the ranch, same thing. Um, my brother had right up there off of Corona. Those dogs, you didn't go in his yard because they were working all the time. That's what they did. It seems like th the attacks that occurred, and I'm just like I said, I'm just reading this report. These were young kids probably walking up and down and didn't, didn't know how to handle the dog, didn't know what the dog was capable of. Yeah, he attacked three children. But it seems like there's been some training done and things like that. Um, this is Norco. We love our critters. And it's worth probably taking a chance on this dog. I'll agree that uh, 300000 is probably more reasonable. Uh, and I appreciate it, Ziggur, what you said about the cost, because it is costly. So, you know, I'm, I'm willing to give the dog a chance. What the heck? <coughs> Any other comments from council? I, I want to thank you for giving the uh, dog a second chance. Um, I, I think the 300000 on the liability I'm fine with, but uh, what uh, Mrs. Dixon said is, Frank, uh, I'd like to add a, a condition that uh, just put a chain link top on that enclosure. That shouldn't be a big impact. It's condition mm -hmm. 14 already in the Is it already report. in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's conditioned. Oh, I'm sorry, Frank. Okay. All right, so um, the, uh, to, to clear up uh, Linda Dixon's uh, concerns, the first kennel you saw on the side of the house, which had a dirt bottom right. and no top, that was not approved by No Ground Control Services. The other one is. The second one is because it does have a top and a cement bottom, and it's uh, over. It's sitting underneath a patio. So it's out of the elements. It can't climb out because it has a, a top on it, and it can't dig out because it's on a cement bottom. Regardless, of, I've been told by um, the owner that when they do leave, they plan on keeping it in the house in the crate anyways. Correct. So, the, which gives we you extra redundancies for doing that. Uh, but if they do choose to use a kiln, the one that's approved is the one that's on the patio that has a cement bottom and a covered top, not the one that's on the side. I, I, I showed that because just to be transparent to say there is another kennel there, but that's not one we recommend by Animal Control Services. And you're good with that? I'm good with that. Okay. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Councilman Bash, do you have anything? Well, I just want the public to know there are 21 conditions for this dog, 21. And so the owners are going above and beyond as far as due diligence goes to take care um, of this dog and give the dog another chance. So, uh, And then I also want the residents to know um, in our report and the things that we have, uh, the dog was tested by a trainer uh, and things like having it on its back and people laying over the top of it. Um, Frank and Animal Control tested that dog without the owner present, not at the house, like running up on the dog, yelling at the dog, doing things that most dogs would become upset about and the dog showed no aggression, correct, Frank? So um, I just want residents to know that staff has gone above and beyond to make sure that this is legitimate and not, you know, 
again, showing due diligence, and thank you, Frank, for the thoroughness of your report. And then also thank you to the owner's 21 conditions. We approve some building projects that don't have that many conditions. So just as a, as a side note, um, we do have the dog trainer here as well that did the stress testing. If you had questions for her or wanted to pick her brain about the dog, she's here as well for your review if necessary. So thank you. May I add, Madam Mayor, um, the applicant paid for the third party trainer who we selected. So that was one of the conditions too. So that shows that she really cares about trying to do to do the right thing. So with that, Councilman Bash, is there a second? At 300,000. Okay, motion to approve at 300,000. Is there a second? Second. It's been properly moved and seconded to uh, approve the permit with a $300,000 uh, insurance policy. Please vote. Motion passes unanimous. Okay. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we still have a couple items on the agenda. They're rather large, our operating budget and capital budget. So council would like to take a five minute break to use the facilities and we will um, adjourn for that recess now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're, I'm gonna go ahead and call the meeting back to order and we're gonna proceed with uh, the back on our regular agenda and the order is presented. So we're on item 6A, which are public hearings. Again, same thing that we just did. We're gonna have a staff report and presentation, council questions of staff. I'll have the public hearing, or I'll open the public hearing, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back to council for discussion and action. So item 6A is approval and adoption of the City of Norco operating budget for uh, fiscal year uh, 1920 and authorizing the appropriations um, therein and amending the fiscal year 1819 budget. So uh, Gina, you are up with your report. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Uh, tonight we'll be requesting um, review and adoption of resolution number 2019-37, approving and adopting the city operating budget for fiscal year 2019-2020 and authorizing appropriations therefrom, as well as adopting resolution number 2019-38, approving an amendment to fiscal year 2018-2019 annual budget and authorizing changes in revenues uh, thereto. And I will move forward with a presentation and I'd like to thank you. I've calculated you have spent about probably 11 or 12 hours listening to fee study discussions and budget discussions over the last five months or so. And um, uh, I will um, get into a little detail here because I have to, but I will move quickly through the presentation. Now, in beginning to the to uh, present our fiscal year 2019-2020 operating budget. I'll be uh, going through some of the numbers that were presented over the last few months and also revise along the way. I'll go through that um, journey as well. The operating budget for the city, which does not include CIP, is $41,662,825. This includes general fund, water, sewer, gas tax, M NPDS, I'll get into the definition later, housing, miscellaneous grants, CDBG, and AQMD funds. The general fund is the city's primary operating fund with total projected expenditures of $21,590,519 and revenues of $20,847,337. This is resulting in a $743,182 decrease in fund balance and um, our estimated fund balance as of June 30th, 2019 will be, we're estimating $12,861,346 and projected fund balance at the year end of 2020 of $12,118,164. And uh, just a few more lines getting through the dollars. Our estimated water fund expenditures of uh, expenditures for the water fund of $10,804,166 and revenues of $13,073,178. Uh, 
estimated sewer fund expenditures of $7,170,000 and $310, and revenues of $7,764,000 and $321. So that's the detail. And just an overview of the expenditures that we've um, been discussing over the last few months. Our budget is stable with no new programs or full-time employees. Our um, funding is estimated for sheriff's contract to increase by 5% or $306,000. We have an estimated 5% increase in our county fire contract of $222,000. Our UAL, or unfunded accrued liability, is increasing uh, by $284,000. And our uh, current salary adjustments are 3%, which, as discussed earlier, includes public works director um, a salary adjustment and a reclassification uh, from a management analyst position to a communications manager. City employees continue to pay their full share of employee portion of pension contribution. And the city continues to provide reduced funding to pay down post-retirement health care cost liability. This includes $100,000 towards a circulation element that's being paid for by a fee that was adopted and um, implemented in the current fiscal year. We currently have $100,000 and we're most likely going to continue to accrue that revenue for other general plan um, elements. We're also including the budget of FEMA reimbursement that we received a few years ago um, regarding a flooding uh, occurrence and uh, the federal government's requiring us to return some funds regarding the purchase of K-rails. We're including increased water costs and our National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System or NPDES fund is supporting itself, itself this year. Um, we're lucky in that sense. Um, other cities don't have that ability, but we are going to be spending more uh, for the required permit processes this next year. So we may be in the future dipping into um, the general fund to assist with that. This is a, a chart of our expenditures, and I should let you know in presenting this, it, it is, um, we have an interesting journey here. I've been showing budget to budget comparison. I could have easily shown a year end to budget comparison, um, but what you see here is um, how we adopted the budget. It was amended in February, and then how it compares to our current budget. When you look at the numbers, the dollar um, for fire safety, for fire and safety, public safety in total, you'll see that may not look like 500,000 there. That's because we're comparing year end to budget in that larger conversation. When we budget our, uh, I indicate this in the staff report, when we do budget, we budget conservatively. We budget fully our salaries. If there's a vacancy, that savings does occur. So we uh, tend to compare budget to budget. And then we'll come back at mid-year and adjust. So um, that can help us with some surprises that I'll be showing you shortly. It doesn't happen often, but it happened this year. In terms of revenues, we are looking at uh, an increase of 470000 or 2% as compared to the 1819 amended budget and 184000 less than the projected. Now, this is relatively flat. We do have some strong revenues that are coming interest earnings because we have a reserve that I'll be talking about shortly. Um, and we have um, uh, some hotel revenue that's coming in that I'll be discussing. We are conservative in our development revenue projections. Uh, these are the projections I come back to in February, indicating that we've got some development money. We had, um, in terms of sales tax, when you look in your budget document, you're going to see that we uh, received, we're going to receive 7.5 million in sales tax this year. A lot of that, about 400,000 is prior year because the state of California has a, a software system they implemented that's very difficult for businesses to give their sales tax receipts and very difficult for the state to distribute out. And I've just been told today they see it continuing. So, um, and it may impact or measure our revenue slightly. It just means it'll be delayed. So I just want to give you a heads up on that. Property tax is increasing by 153000 due to increased assessed valuations and residual tax increment from our successor agency bond refundings. And uh, the next bullet there I just discussed. TOT, we're estimating 100,000. That, that originally was just for six months, and I thought it was actually a little aggressive, but I'm hearing that Wood Springs will open in the summer. So we could have a, a nice mid-year surprise on that. 
again, interest earnings is going up um, because of our reserves and um, some healthy investments, so healthy and safe investments. We're seeing a continued decrease in our state reimbursement for pension and health care liabilities from the former RDA. RDA. The city is still pursuing that with the state. And here is an overview of our revenues. And you'll see it's um, property taxes are increasing, and that's great. Assessed valuations are up. Um, the cities are, um, of course, sensitive to the economy. We're not anticipating a downturn. Um, that could be in the next few years, but at this point, uh, property taxes, assessed valuations are looking good. Our VLF is, is also increasing um, in a stable manner. And you see the interest income of 135,000 increase um, there. One small note, administrative overhead transfers, I'll get to that. That is um, an increase in our cost allocation plan distribution from our water and sewer fund. Now this is the beginning of the journey that we brought to you in May, and it showed that we were estimating a year-end um, surplus of 657,000 and a deficit in the next year of 986,000. And we, we discussed this uh, journey at that time. Uh, then um, the meeting uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about some more changes, and I'll briefly go over those. We are looking at an overhead charge to our storm drain fund of $209,000, and that's in included in our um, amendment to the current fiscal year. We're also, we just received a residual tax increment increase of $69,000 and above our projected amount and a reduction in our CAL FIRE projections of 190000 Our proposed budget is an, ha, includes an increase to our fee study of 153000 Again, that's conservative at this point. And we took the residual, we're estimating we're going to get the same amount next year for a residual tax increment, so that impacts our next year's revenue. For expenditures, we looked at uh, seeing a reduction in CAL FIRE pro projections of $200,000, a CPI increase of $80,000, a FEMA reimbursement, as I mentioned, of $49,000, and miscellaneous adjustments of $25,000, an additional $20,000 impact to the general fund for the upgrade um, in, uh, to the communications manager and salary adjustment for public works director. Now this brings us to um, the final look for how we are for as of June 30th, 2018. As you can see, we're projecting a $1.1 million uh, revenue over expenditures. We don't like to say surplus, uh, totaling $12.8 million. And again, just want to stress, as, if I, as I have stressed the last few weeks, this is one-time revenue and one-time expenditures. It's like, like getting your IRS uh, um, uh, surplus back or if you got one, <laughs> and you want to put that away and spend it on one time item. And then for next year, you've got, uh, for year end 2019, we're looking at a $743,000 deficit, which will be covered by, uh, creates a balanced budget by working on a reserve in this particular case. And we're uh, ending with a $12.1 million surplus. Um, Beth on balance, excuse me. And briefly, our water fund uh, will have a rate increase on July 1st. It is looking at um, a $5.9 million uh, working capital as of June 30th, with $2.2 million for f the rate stabilization uh, and operation reserves. In terms of the sewer fund, uh, we are looking at uh, a $1.1 1.7 million in operating reserves and 1.9 million available for sewer capital. And this is all ending June 30th, 2020. I'll be back in February to share with you how the Water and Sewer Fund did in the current fiscal year, and we'll look at transferring money to the capital fund at that time. And, and just as a reminder, uh, I believe this is the third year we are not increasing the sewer rates um, because of the significant uh, improvement in the financial position of the sewer fund. Our information technology fund will have an IT assessment plan this year, as well as uh, the implementation of a community development software, as discussed earlier. And this will be uh, will complement and be a part of our citywide ERP program, our financial system. 
And we do have one budget request uh, that is outstanding. It's $30,000 for uh, a Cal Recycle uh, consultant to uh, assist in implementing the outreach for SB 1383. It, They'll be conducting its ex inspections expected by Cal Recycle and conduct outreach expected by Cal Recycle. And finally, the budget amendment for the current fiscal year. This is for the administrative overhead. Uh, over the last few years, city staff has worked on uh, flood control projects, and we are moving that admin overhead to the general fund where it is ha was used for that particular project. And that is included as an amendment. And the water and sewer fund, uh, we're just doing a little cleanup. This is, this is our first year of transferring funds from the water and sewer fund. I budgeted originally an amount uh, in last year's budget, and then we made the adjustment in mid-year. And um, if you look at the budget, I, I did not remove the original budget transfer. So it's an inflated budget amount. The actual is correct. So we're making a, a budget adjustment in the water and sewer fund on that transfer. And that is it. If you have any questions on the budget for staff or... Does council have any questions of staff? Councilman Hoffman? I have one. And I'm reading this. And so there are no changes to the sheriff's current budget staffing still they we're at, we're keeping the traffic officer and the CSO as we had approved last year correct correct okay and lieutenant is have we figured out our the other sergeant position has that been filled yet the county paid position no it hasn't been filled yet okay and so just a clarification and checking we we're, we're supposed to be at seven a supervisor for every seven on patrol uh, per decision was made during the Taisha Miller situation I know it's years ago the shooting that occurred that was something that came out that it was approved so somehow or another in our in our discussion in a little history here when uh, this position, the, the, the department, was a sergeant position until Ross Cooper came along and he changed that position to a lieutenant position and we got the buildings here in this and uh, we increased the size. So somewhere along the line, we got two sergeants here. And so just, that's a little history. And I don't know if you had a chance to find that out is we got the two sergeants here because of that. And I know there's a, a sergeant shortage, so hopefully we'll be able to backfill that position for uh, for you this year. So, um, and then on the, uh, on your budget request, uh, we did talk earlier about the $25,000 for the naming rights program and if the rest of the council can agree with me, I'm, I'm not advocating that, but perhaps come mid-year, we look at not the naming rights, but we have a beautiful facility up there. And somehow or another, and I'm sure Councilman Newton probably has some numbers that will tell you that it probably cost us about anywhere from fifty to sixty thousand dollars to put a siding on that wall that we can build ourselves an advertising wall inside there. And perhaps we could throw that at Andy, your staff and economic development. Let's see if we can start selling some space in that wall. And I, I'm just asking this is to look at it mid-year, come back to us with a deal that we probably can look at making some revenue on that. Because if we're not going to have somebody go out and hustle down a naming, then let's let's do it ourselves. Maybe Diana McGrew can figure out how to sell the thing. You know, without a good good budget, thank you, Gina. Other questions of staff, Councilman? Just to uh, follow up on Councilman Hoffman's budget, you should be sitting down there. Sixty thousand uh, dollars. It's going to run us about forty-two thousand to forty-four thousand now. Um, but if 
there's any more Trump tariffs, that steel price will go higher to the sixty thousand dollars. Okay, so just be aware of that. But that that's the current price today on on what Ted's proposing. I just want to. Probably take a five-year return. It would come down about 20 feet, Berwyn, all the way across the east side wall. No engineering will be required because when it was originally designed, it was with that skirting considered it an enclosed building. Other questions of staff? I have one. Um, community outreach still isn't in the budget. So can I get an explanation why that is when there was kind of a direction from council last time to include that? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, the last time I think we explained that uh, we are still trying to look at the uh, how to reorganize the community outreach and uh, part of that is uh, uh, reclassifying the uh, management analyst position to communications manager position so we can develop a comprehensive program. I think we did advise you at that time at that time that once we know that what that cost is, um, we will we'll come back to you with a request to uh, have that appropriated into the budget. So that wouldn't take place until mid-year? Uh, it can take place any time before the mid-year. The, the budget adjustment can be made at any time. Okay, so then I'm just going to put it out there that my expectation is it would be done by mid-year, um, if not sooner than that, since it was a directive from council. Uh, any other questions or comments? I want to comment to that. Um, I just want to caution that we don't, I, I'm totally on board with what you just said, uh, Madam Mayor, but, but the creative side of it is something you don't rush. And um, I went through, as we began to talk about this, and I've looked at about 200 cities and looked at their video programs, and most are really bad. They don't sell the city, they all look the same. And uh, I think that, um, I think we got really lucky with the Measure R ones. We, we were able to put those together and they came out really, really well. Um, but I just think we need to take our time, create a team, and I think that maybe what needs to happen is in order to form this, we really make sure that staff understands exactly what we want to sell and how we want to sell it. Because this could look really, just, just in looking at some of these other cities, it could look really, really bad. And I think we could do it real, like I say, whoever, when years were put together, they looked really good. And again, I'm, I'm, I like the idea of the mid, mid year, but, um, and I would like to put a fire under the whole thing, but I also know we shouldn't rush it. Creativity is not something you can, it, 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 we, we, there's a whole bunch of things that I think go into this. We're a very unique city, and I would like to make sure we capture that right out of the box. Um, right, and, and I, I agree with you. Yeah, and I, and I get where you're coming from. I guess in the budgeting process, putting um, a placeholder or encumbering some money up front isn't committing to starting the process tomorrow. Do you want to make a motion oh. then to add? Uh, Fifty thousand dollars to the budget, or I think uh, oh, and, I, and and I agree with Robin. Is <clears throat> we have a couple of events, and and maybe I'm mistaken, and so <coughs> we're not going to do the community outreach before then. We with going to the fair and and things like that. That's been kind of shelved then. No, we're, no. we're, we're planning to go to the. To fair. Okay, where we have community things, and then this would be on top of that, correct? That's correct. So zero dollars would be spent, but the city would still be at the rodeo or the fair. 
Yeah, as you know, there are uh, staff time that uh, those who participate in the community outreach are uh, exempt employees, those who don't get uh, paid for overtime, and uh, uh, that is how we've done it. Uh, this time, obviously, uh, we need to buy some supplies. Uh, we have had some promotional supplies. Uh, we'll, we'll do that again. Um, that usually doesn't cost a lot of money that we couldn't find anywhere in the current budget to uh, to to get going. Uh, some other things we are looking at is actually uh, in, involves uh, some IT uh, recording equipment that uh, uh, will cost some money. We are still in the process of evaluating those and uh, determining those costs. We certainly can have uh, appropriate uh, some contingency in the budget uh, to to do that. But uh, again, our goal is we want to uh, look at what we're, uh, we're going for and have a good cost estimate for that. I, I think Ted's on to something, though, that, that you know, you, I wasn't thinking about that. I think that maybe we need to be filming some of these things and do it with equipment that's very good. I think probably, I mean, if you want to do it really right, you have three cameras. You have two steady cams. <clears throat> um, you're kind of the resident expert at the moment on all this, but maybe maybe that by the next council meeting you could get back to us on what a cameras would cost get some nice cannons or whatever you whatever you decide uh, I, to get. I just don't want us to discontinue it no no I think but we're you're out there something. and I we think, need uh, to be we as a city need to be out in front of the public they need to be aware of what is going on as part of our transparency but it helps us because we learned last year that folks all of a sudden realized, can I do that? Uh, I, they didn't know. They, you sit in that booth and they just, and, and uh, uh, you know, Cheryl and Kelly and everybody else that manned that booth did an excellent job of doing what we're supposed to be doing is promoting this city. So we're not the far off area. We're out in the public eye. And that I just want to see that continue. Mm -hmm. And yes, we have to have the fancy media, but nothing better than sitting down and talking to one-on-one -on -one and handshaking with people it's a good deal that's just my two cents so i don't want to see that so we're talking about i want to see things, i want to see money spent there and doing that so do we do we do we add to the budget a placeholder of x number of dollars what do you think you need andy or are you okay with the where you're at now you understand the directive and everything Twenty-five thousand as a plus holder. Um, again, when we determine how much we really need in terms of equipment and supplies, and uh, we'll come back to you and uh, we can amend that number. So, do you want to add twenty-five thousand to the budget? Is that what you're saying? I, th I think that's a good deal. And <clears throat> like Robin said, we we get this thing, we've got it going, we keep it rolling. We don't let it sit around and get stale because then you run out of uh, ideas. But I like your idea of like events we have, get them on film where you can throw them in on uh, a little video or something to show what we're we're all about, but I don't want I don't want it to die either because that was a successful program last year. Gina, is there any way you can say what did we have in the budget last year for community outreach, approximately? I can look that up. Okay, and I think from our last meeting, the the direction of council was that. We, we were going to keep community outreach and we weren't going to bring the, the balance down to zero. There was to be f funding allowed in that category. It, uh, for 1718, 8,900 was spent and projected the current year of only 1,200, but I f believe there's other costs elsewhere in the budget, an IT fund. And, and, uh, what I know about the Measure R um, experience was it was staff time and the mayor's time, and there really, really wasn't that much cost. We're cheap. So I was low budget. <laughs> You're welcome. The twenty twenty five thousand dollars would be adequate. I am aware that the cameras that were purchased when I was involved with IT um, are are failing, as you might recall. Some 
meetings, they haven't been taped properly because the camera has failed. So the de we definitely need new cameras. Uh, but um, I was referring to those. That could come out of the IT budget. IT is under whose department? Yeah, so it could come out of Parks and Rec. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But just so everyone knows, Matt's been working on uh, the media source of this and uh, has put together a package. So we've been working on numbers to present to Andy. They would look at the videography part of it. What do we need? Because there's also, it's not only the video, but you got to come back and then you got to edit it and do all these other things. So there, there's a whole process and Matt's done a great job of putting some stuff together for us to have the city manager look at. So, But that doesn't take away from the community outreach, which is going to be part of the whole overall plan right and actually Good. in some of the discussions we've had and um, <clears throat> that um, uh, the community outreach uh, the pamphlets uh, w one of the most popular ones was our, our little three folder snap you know that that's a great has all the information in there but things like that that really catch it uh, we've even talked about doing surveys to find out how we can better communicate to the public so all of those are part of the overall staff discussion on how do we keep it moving as Berwin said, don't let it get stale. I'll put you on the spot, Kevin. You're, you sit on that Narco College board. Yeah. I'm sure they have a audio-visual department over there that would probably send some interns over here that would probably help us. Colleges have the best equipment of anybody. And I'm sure that... That woman has stuff you would not believe. And I'm sure that even Robin has some stuff at the high school is pretty cool. Well, actually, we're trying to buy a bunch of stuff for Norco okay. High School to help sell it. So, so, let's, so uh, I'm sure that you'll find a way to get... Brian's staff and get Matt the right kind of stuff, and maybe they'll send some interns over here for no some money, student huh, credit <laughs> to put us together a nice visual program. Yeah, Matt also has been running. Right. Getting ready to fill that position, so. Get some interns. Oh, wow. All right. So do we need yeah. to <laughs> do we need to make a motion, or is it just because we've had the discussion that that adjustment can be made? Uh, no, I think uh, we have a recommended budget. This would be an addition to that recommended budget. So, okay. so I make a motion to approve the budget with an additional twenty five thousand. There you go. Second. Right. And there was actually also the Calvary cycle item. Wasn't sure if that was also approved. It would be in the package, correct? Or does that have to be done separately? Separately, it wasn't so included. Calorie cycle budget. was the not, calorie it cycle. Is not part of the okay, budget, so, so yeah. that has to have a separate motion. So, or you can make a motion. I will redo my motion to also include the calorie cycle. Okay, so it's been moved and does the second still stand? Second, yes. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve uh, our operating budget with the inclusion of uh, 25,000 for community outreach and the 30,000 for the calorie cycle program. Oh, it's a public hearing. Thank you. Gosh, one of these days I won't miss one of these. We have one card. The speaker is Susan Olmstead Bowen. Good evening, Mayor and Council and staff. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm looking at this fund balance, and the fund balance is 60%. And the recommended is 25%. And I'm not so sure, and I know, I've done budgeting for governments. It's very conservative. I think we're going to break even. I would ask that at mid-year you closely look at the revenues. Government's job is not to amass wealth. We're supposed to be spending the money on services, and right now with a 60% fund balance, we're amassing wealth. And I understand that in the 2000, you know, 2012, you guys did a great job of reserving money, and some has to be reserved, because we never know when there's gonna be an economic downturn. But this is excessive. And I think we should look at adding more projects. And we passed Measure R. So we're also contributing more money to the budget. So I would ask that at mid-year you closely look at the revenues, closely look at the estimates,
because I really think we're going to break even this year, and the Measure R will be in addition to this. Thank you. Thank you. So there are no other cards? There are no further speaker cards. Okay, so I'm going to close the public hearing. Do we have to re we have to remake it? No, nope, we don't. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, because I went out of order again. Okay, <clears throat> so <laughs> this one's done. I swear, you guys, one of these days I'll get it right. It's been a long day. I get to try again. Didn't we vote on the? Yeah, you haven't voted. Did we get uh, a second? No. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Why? Yeah, Berwin. Vote. Motion passes unanimous. Okay, thank you. So we're going to try again and see if I can get it right this time. Our next public hearing is uh, item 6B, approval of the five-year capital improvement program for fiscal years uh, 2020 through 2024. Thank you, Mayor and, and Council Members. We're looking to, uh, we're requesting the adoption of resolution number 2019-39, approving and adopting the City of Norco Capital Improvement Program budget for fiscal years 2020 through 2024. And as you're aware, we had our uh, CIP study session this afternoon, and there isn't a PowerPoint on it today, uh, but we do have some changes to what's in your agenda packet. One item was uh, changed this afternoon for the fire improvement fund, and it's reducing the station 57 improvements to $60,000. And that impacts uh, the following fund and account number, 142-761-43115 for building improvements. And another item came up, the city manager requested that I amend the total estimated revenues and estimated expenditures to remove the Measure R-132 projects that were included for presentation purposes only in the CIP. So we're going to reduce the total revenues and expenditures and modify that. The current amount in your agenda packet indicates, um, well actually this is modified down by $60,000. 20, it will now be $29,712,566 for all CIP improvements, including the reduced uh, Station 57 item. And in terms of revenues, revenues will be $23,901,515. And we'll present to you a, a revised CIP uh, with that information, that detail. So just to summarize again, we're removing Measure R projects, which totaled $3,641,125, and we are reducing the Station 57 project to $60,000, and that specifically was replacement of bay doors. How many questions for staff? Uh, on the Measure R, that you said removing the projects, but in a previous Measure R meeting, did they not vote to backfill um, a, a public safety account? Actually, um, what this, the CIP are just capital improvement, no operating. Okay. Um, and what we want to do is. Maybe I should it. ask that question sooner. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, no, this is actually that would be an operating side, an operating. We we actually the setup for Measure R is we have an operating fund and a capital improvement fund, right. two separate ones, but we're not funding them at for the current fiscal. That, the that's all I want to know. We didn't backfill anything. No. Okay. No, no, I nothing. I just want to make sure on that. No impact of Measure R on the budget. Zero. Right. Okay. Two. <laughs> follow up on that earlier when we did our budget session and for those people that weren't there at our budget session <clears throat> none of our general fund budget or this capital improvement budget included any measure our funding is that not correct correct so uh -huh. it's just so that everyone knows and that and you you related to us that <clears throat> you're going to come back mid-august andy or cost meeting in august so that we will actually be able to 
see the, what the measure our committee recommended and where we implement those, correct? That's so correct. we may be adding to this budget then or looking at where our... Yeah, you certainly will be adding to this budget. Okay, based upon the recommendations and what we approve for Measure R. But this current budget, no Measure R. No Measure R. All right. Measure R. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. There are no speaker cards for this item. Okay, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to Council for discussion. I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 2019-39. Second. Is there it's been properly moved and seconded to adopt resolution 2019-39. Please vote. Motion passes unanimous. All right, thank you. So uh, we're gonna move on to item number seven, which is city council, city manager, and staff communications. I know we're gonna probably have a couple of items here. Um, so I will start with um, Councilman Newton. Do you have anything? Yes. Um, I wanted to ask Council's uh, support with this. Um, so here recently we had a, a, a little item that kind of triggered my interest with uh, uh, with the fire department. It was a, the, the purchase of that ice machine. And it, it, doing further investigation on that, just kind of pricing it out and, and those things, it seems to me that we could improve our purchasing policy, okay? And so, I think we need to consider that uh, maybe we start looking at slowly looking into a, like a part-time purchasing agent. Um, I think that we need to dial this thing in a lot tighter. And it, so it's and, it, and I brought it up uh, under that CDA report about um, how a scope of a project or a work project can can creep on you and like say we have a, a certain vendor I guess I'm looking at you Gina and I'm asking these questions as far as um, where a director has a, a, a certain spending limit okay and let's just say for conversations ten thousand dollars and authorizes a vendor to go out and perform or supply um, for ten thousand dollars and then um, later on he goes back to that same vendor you know supply or, or provide something for nine thousand dollars and a little later you go back to that same vendor and all of a sudden that ten thousand dollar authorization with one vendor is is creeped up so that 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 vendors out there say like for forty fifty thousand dollars. At what point, and and Andy, you can jump on this. That with our purchasing policy, when does council get to look at this? What's the dollar amount that you're authorized to go to, so we don't get into that that creeping and. Do, do we know we're really being competitive? It, it's, and it's something I think we need to provide as, as council. You have nobody behind you. So it's like, okay, I need this ice machine. Go get an ice machine for the fire station. But we don't have anybody out there shopping it. And we overpay. 
or we go to the next item. I'm just using that one for an example. But what what's the allowance? What what do you what dollar amount before it has to come back to council? Do do we have a dollar amount? Yes, we did uh, pass that last summer. Um, we did re reset, according to uniform guidance, our internal purchasing uh, limits. But I do understand where you're coming from, where you can have the, this creep of spending on one vendor you know, mm -hmm. under a certain dollar amount and then coming back and spending under again, and it might sneak by. We, well, it does sneak by. Yes. <laughs> and we do have right. uh, mechanisms to check on that, I should say. But I... I'm also hearing that you know, we just want to share with everybody we are a small city. Right. And um, in larger cities, there is a body that does review that. And maybe everybody's here familiar with a purchasing agent. And it isn't the most pleasant experience when you have a project that you really want a vendor. And, but they, they question you on that. So I understand the, whole, the questioning process is more than just the creep part. It's the questioning the whole process within mm -hmm. the policy and guidelines. So it's, so to answer your question, it's it's bigger than just the creep when it comes to purchasing um, processes. Just the little bit that I see is that I, I, I think we, we have a need for that. And I'm not picking on the chief, I'm just go back to this ice machine example that uh, I got a copy of the invoice from the chief and all it says is, ice machine, $5,600 that we bought from a heating and air contractor in El Monte. So all I do is I Google, ice machines are us, for $3,600. But I don't know, is there more to that story that you know, have to be disposed of correctly? Did it have to be picked up? Whatever. There's no description. There's no model number. Yeah, that's uh, we have the description and and the not breakout. on the invoice. Yeah, and I have the description when we ordered it, which includes labor material markup on the unit because the contractors can mark up the unit. Yeah, from the service provider manufacturer, 3600 but he's entitled to a markup. So I have all of that detail. This was an emergency item that we did based on CAL FIRE telling us it needed to be done and not to wait on this. So could we have gone out and went to bid on this and probably got a better deal? Probably so, but that wasn't the conditions that were presented to us, that we needed to react on this immediately. Well, there may be, in, like, we don't need to belabor that one example, because I think there's another side to that conversation. It's just, from the purchasing standpoint, are we being competitive with that? And that's where I think, you know, we could be lacking. Yeah, sure. Comments. You may. We went through a process here last year uh, to approve a purchasing ordinance, and that ordinance uh, is was well researched, meaning that uh, is very consistent with what you see uh, in most cities, and that provides different levels of authority to um, uh, different individuals and prescribes. <coughs> level of purchases that requires uh, different levels of uh, steps in, in making that purchase. Um, so in, in the issue of split purchasing, which is what is called in the purchasing world, where employees actually uh, issue multiple purchase orders uh, to avoid having to go through a competitive process, unfortunately is, uh, it, it happens a lot. Uh, in, in, in city government, and so the question is, uh, who is monitoring that uh, to make sure that it doesn't happen? Uh, good thing for us, we are uh, certainly a very small city, um, so I, I do not suspect that there is a lot of that that is going on here uh, in the city of Norco, but it's, it's certainly something to be, uh, someone needs to keep an eye on. Um, with respect to having a purchasing agent or a part-time purchasing agent, that is something we can uh, we, we can look into. Uh, first of all, I think our purchasing ordinance, actually we need to have a 
staff needs to formalize the, the procedures that guide that, the administrative policies and procedures that implements that. I think that is something that still hasn't happened yet. I think we need to address that perhaps first, and that will may bring it back to the city council. That will provide a first opportunity to review that process uh, one more time. And uh, 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 in my past experience, I have overseen a large purchasing department, the city of Pasadena, and I know how purchasing agents work. Uh, Quite frankly, uh, they push a lot of paper. Uh, and there is not a whole lot of value that is added to that. Um, on major purchases, whether it be engineering projects or uh, specialized professional services or uh, specifications for building improvement, all of that, that still has to go to the department uh, to specify uh, the product or the services that are being desi desired and, 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 and then uh, go through the purchasing process, which is where the purchasing agent makes sure that you are, in fact, sending out these uh, these specifications to all available uh, potential uh, contractors. Uh, so they do have some value, but uh, uh, again, I think we need to first of all take this one step at a time, finalize our uh, purchasing ordinance uh, by imp coming back to the city council with uh, uh, the administrative policies and procedures uh, that guides the implementation of what we have in the ordinance. And then we can take a look at whether we need uh, a part-time purchasing agent or even a full-time purchasing agent, uh, if we believe that uh, uh, it will pay for itself uh, through cost savings. I think every employee, every department head has a responsibility currently uh, to follow that process as, as, as outlined. Uh, I get it sometimes uh, uh, time may not permit uh, that they want to uh, for one reason or the other but those those that is the city ordinance and everyone has a uh, there is a requirement to follow those uh, quotation process and uh, making sure that uh, you know, whatever we do we are doing it on a on a competitive basis and uh, that responsibility that lies currently with the department head, working directly with the, uh, um, uh, with the executive secretary or other clerical staff in their department. Uh, of course, the check on that is in the finance department, which then uh, is responsible for issuing the final purchase order on these things. And, and, and the way it's set up is that uh, if they have questions or concerns or issues, uh, that could not be resolved, and I am also there to make sure that uh, uh, those city rules that have been approved by the city council uh, are followed. Well, and, and, and Andy, I appreciate what you're saying, that, and hopefully it's the same thing, but if I understand you correctly, we just need to improve and communicate our procedures with our purchasing policy. And I think what may help is like, um, Planet bid. You know, it was a bidding system service that you know maybe start implementing that. So I I just like to see us move forward more on the the establishing the procedures. Okay. And and that how procedures would affect with the overall policy. Go ahead. Thank you. Dana, do you have anything? I have nothing. Thank you. Matt? Chad? Steve? Brian? And who's our MC? And I can't be there because I'm at WRCOG. I just realized that. I'll help you out, buddy. All right. Thank you. All right. Teamwork at its finest. Gina? Chief? Lieutenant? Just a reminder with the uh, 4th of July coming just around the corner here, um, we are doing our fireworks enforcement program uh, the week of 4th of July, which is a um, zero tolerance um, enforcement period in conjunction with animal control and code enforcement. Um, you know, fines can range up to the 
$2,000 threshold, so uh, it's important to uh, obviously report illegal fireworks in the city. Uh, that way uh, we protect our um, our rural atmosphere with our animals and and their uh, lifestyle as well. So, uh, just a reminder for residents uh, to report fireworks. You can call our sheriff's dispatch um, at a non-emergency line, and uh, we'll go ahead and have a deputy respond out. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Hanna. Speaking of that $2,000 fine, I remember last year, the day after the 4th, I was up here at the city clerk's counter and some guy walks in and he had a ticket there and he said, who do I write this check to? His kids had got one that before and I thought, well, he didn't even put up a fight. Councilman Hoffman. Come on. Yeah, Brian, or uh, I know JCSD, and this is something for the public, they're going to have their fireworks, what, on the 29th? The 29th, yes. So then, and then Silver Lakes is doing theirs on July 4th. That's correct. So we might want to put something out to we, the residents. We already did, and it went out today to all of the homes along all of our bluffs. Okay. That's Plus, it's being advertised on our other publications. Okay, thank you. They're in the same place. Uh, yes, they're going to be in the same place on the JCSD property. And then, uh, to, I guess a piggyback on what, a piggyback, pig, uh, yeah, to follow up what Greg said, and something we, we may want to look at in when you develop this uh, purchasing property, I know Chad has it with his preferred contractors when he calls people out. And to do something emergency, something you already have a list of things that's going to cost you to do that. You know it comes out in a last-minute deal. You need to quickly fix something. And perhaps that we should be looking at in our purchasing thing as preferred vendors that will give us a yearly bid and say, hey, you know what? You need this. Here's where it is. This is what I can give you. Rather than going out and searching and trying to do that. So you have an idea of these companies that are already servicing companies, maybe products or sales, uh, just like that ice machine. Hey, this is what I can give you. And you know, you just go hit, hit them up and uh, tell them you want a good deal and then just put them on your list so that they are can, you know, they know that you're going to go buy from them. Those can be interesting you have to keep up on them so you don't have any any uh, uh, nepotism ones from certain family members but it's one way to, to keep your costs down that they're going to give you these special rates if you buy from them so just something to think about that's it thank you mayor andy nothing colin nothing thank you councilman bash yeah, I have one thing. Um, one of my concerns, I've talked about this before, is that we as a city trying to protect the half acre lots, um, as horses come and go, um, one of the things we were working at over at Norco College um, was the idea of creating um, small lot farms. And I'd really like to look into that. Um, I don't know what's going to happen at Norco College right now. But I think that anything we can do to maintain either equestrian usage, in other words, what is a person going to pay for? Why, why would they take care of a half acre parcel? And, you know, one of the trends, unfortunately, has been people want to move large businesses literally into their backyards. They, that will not sustain a rural lifestyle, no matter what anybody says. History proves that. Um, but I'm thinking that if you can create a situation where you try to attract boutique farms, um, I didn't realize this. There's already a whole bunch of them here in Norco. I and mean, we have this great FFA program. If you can link something at Norco College rather than having to go to Mount Sac, um, um, I think it might be something that we can look at that would bring people into town that literally want to help preserve open space and their backyards. Um, and it would also be kind of fun. So I'm just wondering, Andy, and now that you're through the budget process, maybe we can uh, bring that back. Maybe there is a consultant that Robin and I have talked to. Maybe have him come and talk to us and do something like that. I'll send you his information. And that's all I have. Thank you. With that, um, if there's nothing else, ladies and gentlemen, this meeting is adjourned.